since I've been on Joe Rogan, the initial backlash was phenomenal. My next question is going to be like, what kind of prep did you do? Um, because in listening to you talk, it sounds like you've studied the form of, I would say, I don't want to say debate because it, that's associated with like college or high school debate, like formal debate, but like the idea of like how to have a challenging conversation like that. Yeah. One thing that's very frustrating, would hope that you know this immediately, you know, working in a university setting, you can know something and not have any idea how to teach it. It's just mm -hmm. Teaching is a fundamentally different skill and argumentation, especially live argumentation, is also a fundamentally different skill. People are generally pretty intelligent, but the only thing that messes it up is the social pressures or whatever weird garbage they have in relation to a particular idea. Everybody is always virtue signaling. signaling. Okay, stop. Every okay, you're taking all my talking points. Yes. <laughs> One of the most important things I've realized over the past several years, especially through my watching of Jordan Peterson, is Welcome everyone to another episode of Bridges. Today we are joined by Dr. Flint Dibble. He is an archaeologist. You study at which university? At Cardiff University. At Cardiff University, unfortunately from the UK. Well, I'm not from the UK. I'm from Philadelphia. But yeah, I'm in the UK now. Tell us a little bit about your expertise. So I'm an archaeologist and I've been an archaeologist my whole life. Um, and I study specifically ancient Greek animals. So I look at kind of like the environment and climate change in the ancient Greek world and how people adapt and how that relates to kind of urbanism and the building of cities. Um, and so that's my main focus. And I'm an archaeological scientist. I do isotope analysis on animal teeth right now. And that gives us a sense of kind of the nitty gritty of kind of animal management and food production that these economies are based on in the past. And so using that, we can look at kind of like uh, topics like how do people adapt to climate change in the past, which I think is really relevant to today. Um, at the same time, recently in the last three years, I started to get on social media and I realized that there's this growing popularity of pseudoscience and pseudo-archaeology and specifically around the topic of Atlantis, right? So Plato's Atlantis, there's, I don't know how many people, there's a lot of polls that show about 50% of Americans believe that Plato's Atlantis is a real thing or specifically a different version of it. 50%? 50%, yeah. I'm We're dreamers. Shocked. I know. We're dreamers. And it's not even Plato's Atlantis. It's this idea that there's this civilization that existed in the Ice Age with advanced technology that has been wiped off the earth and there's no traces of it, but it's the what seeded all of civilization later on. Oh, okay. So and it's like a, it's a, like a tenth theory of not just specifically Atlantis, but any kind of buried civilization. Yeah, and it's specifically this idea of a global civilization that existed. It's what taught people how to build pyramids and megalithic structures and stuff like that. It introduced agriculture to hunter-gatherers, and it's what civilization comes from. That's the idea here. And believe me, there's not it's not just that there's no archaeological evidence for it. There's archaeological evidence against this idea, right? And so I started realizing just how popular this was, and there were not many archaeologists that speak out against this, that kind of say, hey, guys, uh, hello, we actually have a lot of really good archaeological evidence, and it doesn't say this at all. This is totally flawed. And this kind of idea, it's sort of wrapped up these days in conspiracies, in conspiracism and conspiracy thinking, and it's a big component of that. And so as I started uh, writing on Twitter and blogs and YouTube and podcasts about this, I, I became more and more aware of the one of the leading proponents of this idea, which is Graham Hancock. And when his show came out on Netflix, Ancient Apocalypse, I watched Watched it. I read some of his books, and then I wrote a Twitter thread that went really viral. I don't know, 100,000 people read it, something like that. And it got picked up by the media, and then I wrote an op-ed, and then before I knew it, I ended up on Joe Rogan to debate Graham Hancock on his ideas of this lost civilization. And I don't know, I, I think the results were pretty good. I got probably about a thousand messages from former Graham Hancock fans that said, wow, I now realize that archaeology has its shit together. And so, you know, I think we need to go and speak to people in, in, a, in an informed way, I guess is the right way to put it. We need to uh, draw on misinformation research that's out there to try to attack this spread of misinformation in today's world. And so that was my, my plan and my approach to it. I'm super curious, what do you think leads to, like this is a common problem I see in tons of fields, which is kind of the academic expert hesitancy to speak out really boldly, especially. Um, a lot of academic experts at this point will like post on Twitter and they'll like, they'll, they'll stay kind of within their sphere, but they're very rarely gonna go after Graham Hancock, for example. Um, and when that happens, they might like back down for fear of like public scrutiny and stuff. What do you think is like driving within kind of the academic field that hesitancy for the social media eye to be on you? 
took some time for me to get to that point. It's, I remember the first time when I sort of engaged with Graham Hancock on Twitter, I immediately blocked him for fear that he'd reply, right? It was my immediate gut instinct. I was talking about a completely different show on Atlantis, and other people were picking it up, including some of these neo-Nazis that are into Atlantis, and I was like, block, 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 I do not want this attention. And uh, I can tell you the attention now that I get more of it is also not very fun. Since I've been on Joe Rogan, the initial backlash was phenomenal. It, I, I really made a, a dent um, in people that believed in this idea, and I got mostly really good feedback from his former fans. But uh, what was it? It was in mid June when a few of his uh, former, a few of his current fans started making, yeah, this year started making YouTube videos about me, and he started boosting it. Since then, the last two and a half months, I guess it is, I have been bombarded with negative bigotry, hatred. Um, there, my friends call it a Flint hate cult that has sort of sprung up in the last two and a half months, and my emails are flooded. They call my employer to get me fired. They do all these kind of things. They, they, they say really nasty anti-Semitic stuff about me. And so there's justifiable reason why academics don't always want to put their neck out. I still think what I did is the right thing, and I would do it again. And I would actually argue that some of my colleagues should also speak up. I think that there's good ways to do that. But you do need to be able to protect yourself against that kind of backlash. And that's tough as an academic. Like, where I work is public information. My email address is public information. There's no way around that being a, a, a teacher and a scholar that needs to be out there. And so, you know, it's kind of scary. Um, that said, every single person I've met on the street that recognized me from that, they've all been very positive. I've you, never met anyone negative on the street. Yeah. You've never have you ever met somebody that said they're a hater, but they're nice in person? No, no. Oh, okay. I, I I've met some people that said, hey, I still think that Graham Hancock is right, but I think you did a great job on there. Okay. So I had a few people say that, but they weren't haters of me. Um, so yeah, thankfully. Gotcha. <laughs> I have a lot of uh I don't know how much you looked up at me, but I have a lot of haters, but I've never had a negative interaction in real life. I'll even get sometimes people that come up to me and they laugh about the horrible stuff they type about me online because I guess with their real life it's a lot different. And it's funny how uh, <clears throat> dehumanizing seems like a strong word, but like I've had people come up to me and it's like, oh my God, like I, you blocked like three of my accounts. I always like spam you and tell you to kill yourself or whatever. Like, <laughs> I, but I'm just like messing with you, dude. Like you're so cool. Like will you take a picture with me? And it's just like, okay, yeah, sure. Huh. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Okay, that's good to hear actually. That yeah. gives me some more confidence, yeah. yeah. It reminds me of that, that like anonymity effect, like how it's very easy to be uh, exceptionally hateful online behind a keyboard with a anime PFP and a name and numbers. Um, but the moment you get IRL, most people like chill out and settle, which is why kind of the internet being the now like social medium of discourse is very spooky uh, in many ways, which I'm sure drives academics away specifically. Yeah, I think that's part of it. And I, I, you know, I mean, look, before I even did it, I met with somebody from the university, from Cardiff University, and they were like, first of all, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. And I'm like, no, I want to do it. And then they're like, these are our guidelines and advice on how to protect yourself. And I followed about half of them. But uh, the other half, like I wasn't going to make my Twitter account private. That's one of my main uh, fora to communicate, right? And so I don't want to do that unless I really have to. And I have locked it very temporarily at times when I had a ton of trolling. But uh, the world is not built for online uh, stalking very well, especially, I think, especially Europe. Um, I know at least in Sweden and I think a few other countries, like it, all of your information will just be publicly listed. Everything, like address, phone number, like how many, how much you paid in taxes, like everything is just publicly available, huh. uh, which is okay. Like forty years ago, when you know a hater might come from your neighborhood or maybe in your city if you really tick somebody off, but now the whole world can just look up everything about you. It's like very spooky. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, need privacy sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you get a lot of um, what, what were the responses from other academics? I could see people being jealous. I could see people being happy. I could, well, yeah, what, how was that? So before going in, I would say that the community of archaeologists was very divided on my choice to do this, right? Um, I think about half my friends and colleagues were like, this is the worst idea, you, worst decision you've ever made in your life. Don't do it. And I was expecting actually several people who I knew and uh, who really were against it to write a bunch of op-eds afterwards about it, saying this is not what you should do as an academic. You should not be platforming these people and, and legitimizing them. Yeah, I was going to say, do you think those people, was it out of concern more for you or? 
it sounds more like for the field or for did the discourse in general? Or I think I think both me and the field, okay. um, a combo of both. I mean, I don't think anybody out there really hates me. I I, I think I'm a mm. nice dude, um, but within the field, I I'm fairly well known and I know people and I I I'll get drinks with them at conferences or whatnot. And so you know, in general, we're a happy, friendly community of archaeologists. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of concern about the field. Graham Hancock has been challenging the field of archaeology as a whole, very very directly. He had a debate set up with Zahi Hawass, and before the debate, he insulted Zahi so bad that Zahi stormed off stage and left before the debate ever happened. And so he's been challenging the field as a whole, and his Netflix show is extremely popular, and he's, he's been on Joe Rogan 12 times, he's been on a ton of different podcasts, and so he, he very much aggressively has challenged the field, and so people were worried that if I go in there like a scientist, and I do a bad job, it's going to, you know, I'm going to be gish galloped, right? And I'm not going to be able to respond because nobody can respond to a gish gallop. That's going to lead to people no longer trusting the field even less, right? And so there's a lot of worry about that because there's all this discourse about how do you engage with pseudoscience, right? You know, we see this with anti-vaccination. We see this with all kinds of stuff. And so there's a lot of worry that if a scientist goes in a big platform and they misstep, that that's going to do more harm and lead more people to di have distrust in expertise. Um, Fortunately for me, the results were really, really good. Um, the, 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 the immediate uh, response, it was really clear. I, I did not, I, I want to be really clear. I did not expect to go in there and actually convince Graham Hancock's fans that he was wrong. I was hoping to appeal to people that were in the middle that thought, hey, maybe this is an interesting idea. Let's see what an expert has to say. But he, he came in there and <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. He didn't really bring a lot of evidence. He instead tried to attack me and the field with personal attacks. And that did not go down well, even with his own fans. And so that led to a lot of his fans on Reddit. You can see this on Reddit. Heck, you can even see this on 4chan, where they insult the hell out of me. But they say, you know, the Hancock didn't bring any evidence. And so he lost a lot of fans. And so because of that, I had almost no backlash from people in my field. It was really clear that, that, that I represented the field well and that it had actually it, it achieved better than we I could have ever imagined even I'm not Did you feel lie. like the weight of the field on you going <laughs> into that debate or were you thinking like oh my god like I've spent my life uh, you know researching archaeology and if I screw this up like I've delegitimized my field maybe at this point maybe more than any single archaeologist ever could in the history of all of or did you not consider these now I'm giving you existential <laughs> no <dread> pressure or... <laughs> no, no, no. I mean so yeah obviously that thought went through my head more briefly but I mean at the same time, I figured, look, I am uh, talking with Graham Hancock. Most of the people listening are going to be his fans. They're not going to be the type of people that are really... Uh uh, it's not like you're going to have people that trust in science that are going to all of a sudden not trust in science because of one oral debate. That strikes me as silly. And so I was not that concerned about that. I was a little worried about being uh, lambasted by my colleagues, and therefore that impacts my own career. Um, so that was definitely worrisome. And, you know, before I actually wrote my public letter to Graham, I actually had my whole strategy kind of locked up. And so I, I knew what I wanted to do to deal with a gish gallop. I knew the kind of facts that I wanted to bring. And my one precondition was I got to go first, which is based on misinformation re research, which is pre-bunk rather than debunk, right? You will always want to go in and, and set the context, because if you let them set the context first, and then you're just replying to them, then you, you're, you're, you're starting off on the wrong foot, if you see what I mean. And so I had this whole strategy there, and I, I felt very confident in that strategy. I also, I, I, I got in touch with about 20 of my colleagues so that they could feed me their research, because archaeology is a huge field. I do not know everything about archaeology all over the world. There's millions of sites. And so, you know, I, I, I had them and I had two practice debates where uh, we had uh, actually Graham Hancock's arch nemesis, Professor John Hoops of, the, of Kansas University. He really wanted to debate John Hoops and John Hoops was like, no. And, uh, and so he played Graham Hancock in the, in, the, in the practice debates and we had a couple different people play Joe Rogan at times. And so I went in there prepared, if you see what I mean. Yeah. What? Okay. Um, <laughs> firstly... Uh, let me just take a moment to say good job, um, because uh, I mean, I was, my next question is going to be like, what kind of prep did you do? Um, because in listening to you talk, uh, it sounds like you've studied 
like the form of you know uh, I would say I don't want to say debate because it, that's associated with like college or high school debate, like formal debate, but like the idea of like how to have a challenging conversation like that. Yeah. Um, one thing that's very frustrating, uh, I, I would hope that you know this immediately. You know, working in a university setting, you can know something and not have any idea how to teach it. It's just, mm -hmm. Teaching is a fundamentally different skill, and argumentation, especially live argumentation, is also a fundamentally different skill. Um, and it sounds like you've uh, you've engaged in that at a way more sophisticated level than I would have expected a uh, non-online person or non like a non-pro online debater person. Um, understanding uh, whether it's specific tactics like, you know, flooding people with bad arguments, Gish Gallup, you say over and over again, or the, uh, the fan analysis breakdown is a thing that I engage in. Like if I'm gonna be hosting a guy who's got five fans, who's the craziest, most insane person on the planet, I'm probably only ever helping him. Um, mm -hmm. But if like the, you know, if Hitler wants to debate me, like, okay, well, he's got way more fans than I do. Like I'm probably gonna debate him, right? That, so that the understanding of the difference in, in how many people you could lose versus gain is also something, uh, uh, good analysis. Um, my, my question uh, after the compliments is how, how did you, wh how did you even begin to go down the road of trying to understand how to approach a conversation like this rather than just because I, my my assumption would be, <laughs> I've dealt with a lot of bad academics at this point. My assumption would just be, oh, well, I've got the facts, so I'm just gonna go and do like a dry reading of a couple of bullet points and I should be good and then completely fall apart when the guy hits you with crazy alien conspiracies that you would think you're above and wouldn't even respond to or whatever. Yeah, wh how, 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 what was the process like for getting ready for that debate? Who did you watch? Why, why do you even have these ideas in your head? The idea of pre-bunking versus debunking. Yeah, where'd this come from? Yeah, so um, I mean, obviously some of that was picked up as I started researching how to go about doing it. Um, but look, I, I, I think just like you said, it's not actually a debate, right? You're having a conversation with somebody and there's this idea that like, it's some sort of fair rules-based thing. It's not, it never is. When you have a conversation where two people starkly disagree and are never gonna convince one another because we live in different realities, if you see what I mean, what this actually is in my mind is a spectacle, right? It's a performance for the audience. It's not about sort of, uh, uh, trying to convince him or, or even Joe Rogan. I actually think Joe Rogan did kind of come around to some of my ideas along the course of the conversation, which I did not expect because he's been a, a lifelong Graham Hancock fan. And uh, I, I have no idea. I'd be interested if Graham Hancock ever goes back on Joe Rogan after this. But uh, so I really approached it like it's a spectacle. And me being a classical archaeologist with training in classics and philology, I really approached it with kind of the fundamentals of rhetoric. How do you sort of... Uh, uh, present your argument in a compelling fashion. And so, you know, you got to know your audience and you need to know what you're up against. And so one of the key things, it was a strategy I developed, you know, a year beforehand when we first discussed doing this was what am I going to start with, right? Especially since I get to start. And so, you know, when you think about archaeology, we all think about archaeology as discovery. It's about a monument or it's about an artifact. But that is not 21st century archaeology at all. 21st century archaeology is about context and it's about patterns. So what do I start with? I start with an artifact studied by my former PhD supervisor, uh, Dr. Kathleen Lynch at the University of Cincinnati, which is an Athenian pot with hardcore graphic sex scene on it. Right? And the reason why is every single Athenian pot, and I showed several of them as I started, with hardcore graphic sex, it's not found in Athens. They're found in Etruscan tombs. They're part of an export market in the end. And so that's part of how we study. We don't look at these pots anymore and think that they relate to Athenian sexual mores. They actually relate to what the Etruscans were interested in purchasing from Athenians. And so it's that context, it's that pattern, and that's how you set up this kind of thing with a spectacle that grabs the, the audience by the balls, if you will, right? Okay, I have to ask more fundamentally though, because <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if you're. I don't know if you're aware at the level you're operating on. Okay, most <laughs> people don't. Even people in my experience that are pretty deep in academic fields don't understand the importance of like everything you've just said in terms of how do you convey something to a particular audience, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I, I imagine that if I were to, uh, if I was to push you on a particular thing and I were to go, you, you know, you were to talk about, okay, well, obviously this had to do with the Athens uh, sexuality and you could tell because there are so many pots and like, what are the chances that all of these things are being made and they don't have this, right? You can see that like, I've created a pattern in my head that now I'm seeing and you have to break me out of that pattern somehow, right? Even being aware of that, seems to be like most people would look at, I am even tempted sometimes when people start doing this stuff and I'm like, you're, you're a fucking idiot. Like I, this is, I can't do this right now. Um, right. Or I'm, I'm sure you've heard, I don't know if people have, have you ever heard of like the circularity of carbon dating? Like, oh, yeah. of course you think carbon dating goes up this year because you measure it by based on this and you measure that based <laughs> on this. Right. H how do you, what, what brought you 
I'm asking for like when you were seven years old, which debater did you watch? No, I'm just I'm curious like what got you interested in the idea because it sounds like you've had some kind of uh, something put in your mind the idea of you know your pathos, logos, ethos, your rhetoric, you know triangle. How what got you down that road of even beginning to think how do I be persuasive? You don't have to be persuasive as a professor. They're, the kids are there. They have to <laughs> they have to take your course. You know I that's great. I disagree with you there actually. Sure. I'm saying you didn't and, get paid, but and, yeah. and I think that that's actually the key. So I've mm -hmm. never debated before. That was okay. my first yeah. debate. Right, my absolute first debate, but I am a really good teacher, mm -hmm. and I'm, a, and I'm I, I think I'm a pretty good public presenter. Every time I presented, I remember. So when I was a PhD student, we had this program at Cincinnati where we would go to retirement communities and we go to public schools and we teach. Right, mm -hmm. and I remember this one time I'm in this retirement community, and retirees love archaeology presentations. It's like a slideshow of like <laughs> trips and stuff like that. Right, I remember but, that place. No, I'm just <laughs> and so, but it wasn't just the the retirees that were interested. It was the employees. There was this one guy. He's like 18 years old and he's listening in as he's working and then he finishes his shift he goes and changes and instead of leaving he comes back to finish listening to me present and so I think I, I my philosophy to pedagogy at least one of them is that the the best way to get somebody to learn is to grab their interest you know like I tend to think that everybody out there is smart but they're only smart in what they're interested in because you know you could have somebody who fails every class but they know all the details of baseball Right, and so that's just what they're interested in. And so I think, as a as a professor and a teacher, one of our real jobs is to get people interested, because otherwise they're really not going to pick up on what's going on. So whenever I speak, I try to think through how can I connect with the audience that's there, and that's obviously going to mm -hmm. change from audience to audience. Just to clarify, when I said you don't have to be interesting, what I mean is you don't have to be. There's not like you're not actually forced to, because there's so many kids that are horribly boring. <laughs> um, not me though. So take my classes if you're at <clears throat> Cardiff University. Not you. You. Okay. <laughs> your peers were obviously worried about your performance, that yeah. you would misstep and do a really bad job, which I think is really fair because a lot of academics, when they go into these spaces, do a really bad job mm -hmm. because they have no idea how to engage in this, which is why, in many ways, what you did on Joe Rogan is kind of like gobsmackingly impressive because you overcame an obstacle and hurdle that so many academics seem to really struggle against, um, which is to more or less a live audience being compelling in a highly contentious situation against a figure who's got a Netflix show. So he's already got a lot of positive bias from that. And he's been on the show 12 times. So he's got good rapport with Joe. He's got good rapport with the audience. So you're kind of going into the situation where the deck is stacked against you. And it's like your virgin run, basically, which is kind of wild. And so the question is, how do you get other academics to be as competent as that because I think if academics could learn that skill, so much misinformation could be handled and probably academics themselves would feel less fearful of going into these spaces because they would be prepared. Um, that's what I think is so interesting about your Joe Rogan appearance specifically is it, it's like, I don't know how you did it, but you intuitively created like a step-by-step -step guide of being uh, an excellent academic in a debate space. Yeah. So. Uh, I think there's two components there. One is, one of the main reasons I did this on Joe Rogan was I actually thought that's, like you said, you want to think about the fans. So I'm not going to go debate some YouTuber with like, 10,000 subscribers. It's not worth my time. I'm going to be legitimizing that and bringing more attention, like the oxygen of amplification, right? You think about you're amplifying misinformation if you're not careful about who you talk with. And so by going on Joe Rogan and talking with Graham Hancock, I was going into their space and they were platforming me, right? And so that was really, really important. It's also why I felt like there isn't too much that can go wrong here because I'm in their space, right? I, I'm already at that disadvantage. There are many of the people that were tuning in were already biased against me. So I'm not going to do anything bad with that. But the second thing that you're asking, which is sort of like, how do I convince other uh, professors and scholars and, and, and intellectuals to do this? What I would argue is actually one of the best uh, things to think about is pedagogy. You know, we are trained and we have a lot of uh, literature on how to teach our students, right? And we try to bring our best practices to the classroom. It doesn't always mean you have to be interesting, but you're trying to think about how to engage people on different levels levels because people learn in different ways. And what I've found is that a lot of my colleagues, when they engage in the public sphere, whether it's on social media or YouTube or whatever in a podcast, they they talk in a more relaxed way, I suppose. I, I think speaking in a relaxed way is fine, but let me think about it in the right way. They don't prepare for it in the same way that they prepare for teaching a course. 
When you teach a course, you actually think through what are your learning outcomes? What are your learning goals here? And you craft that very carefully. And, I, and the way you treat your students is different from how you treat people on the street, right? Or on social media. And I try to actually take what we learn from pedagogy, how we teach, and apply that to my public engagement. And so that's actually why I try to argue with my own colleagues and say, you should be doing more public engagement. We actually have a lot of training and experience in how to do this from all the time we spend in the classroom. Classroom. And if we treat the general public the same way we treat our students, we give them patience, for example, when they, when they disagree with us or they don't understand what we're saying. Because you do that with your students, right? But a lot of academics, they sort of, if somebody's snippy with them and disagrees with them on the internet, they become, oh, no, no, fuck you, you know, you're just wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to take that kind of training we have in the classroom and apply it to our public engagement. And I think more academics could be successful if they thought through, you know, consciously, self-consciously, how to do that in the public sphere. Quick question before I dive in on a few of these things. What um what percentage would you guess of like professors that approach teaching or that, uh, that approach teaching in, in this manner? Just curious. I think a lot of people my age and younger. So millennials and younger are much more in grad school. We're usually taught how to teach. I mean, not all PhD programs do that, but a lot of them now do um, because they realize that the academic field itself is changing. Okay. Research positions are less and less common. So you're going to become more often just a, a teacher, right? And, and, and have less emphasis on your research. And so PhD programs are now con more consciously uh, giving instruction on pedagogy itself. Um, it's become more and more trendy over the last 10, 15 years, which means people that have gotten their PhDs in the last 10 years or so are now more informed and nuanced in the way that they approach their teaching. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm curious what the comments will say, because I feel like this is like a 5% or less of teachers like have this type of approach where you're thinking about crafting a, uh, like a lesson plan that connects with the students in a way that's interesting to them, that makes them want to engage with the subject matter rather than like, well, here's the test and this is what I have to teach and let's see how we can fit this in. Like imagine, like teachers to me are, are, are like chefs that like take a prepared meal and then they put it all in a blender and they turn it on and like, okay, here you go. This is everything. And it's like, okay. Uh, for a lot of them, there are some teachers that are passionate, but maybe, I mean, I'm 35, maybe that's changed a little bit. since. I I've think that that's school. changing more and more, especially, you know, different concepts have been coming into play, especially since the pandemic mm -hmm. with a lot of uh, professors and teachers struggling with thinking through how to do this digitally. And, you know, all these different concepts of flipped classrooms and stuff like that, where the idea is you record a lecture in advance so you don't have to lecture in class. Okay. So that therefore you have discussions and engagement in class. Uh -huh. And there's become more and more of an acknowledgement that people just learn in different ways. And so what we need to do when we give instruction is we need to be very diverse in how we instruct within the course of, within, you know, a semester. Yeah. So you don't just give lectures, you mix it up a lot. I also want to, if I can, there's a couple things I'd like to challenge your framing of. I will probably agree <laughs> uh, because I think it's important for people to keep in mind. And I think you already know this. So you mentioned before, like, this isn't a debate when you're going in. It, there's like something more going on. Um, I, I Initially, I had that framing a lot, I think like maybe four or five years ago. And then I've kind of come around to the total opposite end of that, where I feel like debate is not really debate, where you got like the super formal rules, because at the end of the day, the rule set is so rigid and everybody watching isn't really watching to be persuaded. They're watching for the performance of like the, the rubric and the grading of the particular debate. And in, in a way, as silly and as stupid as it is, I think that like online debates more closely mirror like real life debate. Like if you have a um, if you have a disagreement with a loved one, you're not gonna you know okay well we're gonna grade this. I'm gonna do my two minute intro. You're gonna it's gonna you're either screaming at each other or arguing. Hopefully more polite terms or whatever, right? But you have to engage like all of your modes of rhetoric. Okay, well how can I convince you that I really don't want to go to your parents for Thanksgiving and I have a really good reason not to and we can you know barter here um, or even I look at you know I'm doing a little bit of history now, right? Um, the the early conversations when we had the Articles of Confederation when the United States was moving towards a federalized uh, system. System, that those public debates when the um your Hamiltons and everybody were writing under their pseudonyms, uh, trying to convince people like, hey, listen, we really do need a stronger federal government, guys, or else it's not going to work, right? Those writings and being persuasive were the most important thing in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that uh, just to, I understand what you're saying when you're like, it's not a debate, but in a way it is like these are the most important conversations and it's important to learn how to persuade people. Because another thing that you said is that um, that, that I firmly believe, and I, I've gone back and forth on this and you caught me in a good mood today. So I'm going to say, I think people <laughs> are generally pretty intelligent, 
Yeah. It, when, but the only thing that messes it up is the social pressures or whatever weird garbage they have in relation to a particular idea. Mm -hmm. And once this social baggage comes along, people's minds immediately shut down. And my the, the go-to that I had for this was over the COVID uh, vaccination period or whatever, so many horrible arguments relating to uh, the two big ones were ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. These N equals 12 retrospective studies from Indonesia. And I'm like, really? And as soon as uh, DeSantis starts talking about, you know, a couple of years later, trans issues here in Florida, a out of every conservative's mouth, I heard, where are the prospective randomized control trials? And I'm like, <laughs> what? what? Excuse He's like, yeah, well, you, the attrition rate for this particular study was terrible. Over half the participants were like, how do you know this? And it's like, oh, well, because this is a thing that now you care about it, and now the social pressure has changed, and you actually have all these tools in your head, and they're always there, but sometimes mm -hmm. the social baggage uh, covers them up, and that's so frustrating to me, yeah. Yeah, well, that was a lot of different things. Um, I think I think there's a key difference between, say, debating a spouse or a loved one and uh -huh. doing a performance like this because I did not I, I did not convince Graham Hancock. I don't think of much, um, and I would never expect to. If you see what I mean, when you're talking with a loved one about going to your in-laws for dinner, you're actually trying to convince the person you're debating with, and I wasn't even trying. I was trying uh -huh. to convince the audience, and so I think that that's a big difference. I also think that I think you're right. It is a debate in the sense that what we think of as debates, but I think we, a lot of people have this kind of ideal of what a debate actually is in their minds. And I, an actual debate is never that, right? It's yeah. never that. And so I think just embracing the fact that it's a spectacle rather than something, rather than something else. The like, only reason, the only reason I don't like that word spectacle is because if, like, I would argue like teaching is a spectacle yes. to some extent. Yeah. But, um, and like I said, I approached it like I was teaching. Yeah. But I think yeah. people normatively load that word in such a negative way. They whereas, do. yeah, like the, there, there's this term like 20 years ago we used called edutainment. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think that has to be a dichotomy. You can't just, it's not, you're either educational or you're entertaining. Like you can do both at the same time without mm -hmm. Compromising on either, um, so I would agree in that it's a spectacle to some extent, but not like not in the negative, normatively loaded way that people like phrase it like, oh, it's just like a circus performance. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, like people no. persuade you of like who to vote for or who to go to war against. Like these are, it is a spectacle to some extent, but it's really important. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think that uh, that comes down to look, a spectacle is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. A spectacle is a show is really what it is. And when you teach, when you debate, when you give a public performance, you're giving a show if you're going to have people interested and learning from you. And so we should be embracing that. I, and it's sort of like, what is that term? Uh, uh, virtue signaling, mm -hmm. right? You know, you see that online all the time. And it's just like, look, as an archaeologist, God, everybody is always virtue signaling. signaling. Okay, stop. Every okay, you're taking all my talking points. Yeah, <laughs> you're repeating. I, damn, I feel like I'm being trolled. <laughs> But no, yes, but I like, agree. Yeah, but, I want to signal my virtues. Yeah, yeah of course yeah, I want exactly. people to know that I'm like, yeah, of course. Yeah, everything no, 100%. We wear, yes. Everything we say signals who the f*** we are, yeah. right? That's just life. There's no way we can avoid that. And it's just like any time we speak publicly, we're giving a spectacle. There's no way to avoid that. And so to load these terms in a negative way is bullshit in my mind. Mm -hmm. it's, it's demeaning what it actually is. And so I think that we always need to approach this kind of stuff very consciously. It's also why I think things like archaeology and anthropology and history are really useful because they show you in a different context, not in today's world. They show you from 2,000 years ago how people are doing spectacles or virtue signaling or whatnot. And and you have people in a space where they don't have that social baggage, right, of today's world, where you're thinking about stuff they don't care as much about. It's Roman history, right? Who the fuck cares what Caligula did? And so we can actually analyze that in a much more, let's say, dispassionate way and, and, and get people to learn that spectacles aren't always bad. They're yeah. a way to actually convince people of, of something good at times. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so that's uh, – what was the last one? Ah, oh. You mentioned the Articles of Confederation and mm -hmm. the Constitution and stuff like that. Look, real uh, substantive debates don't happen in person impromptu. In the scientific world, they happen in the course of writing, in literature. That's actually how scientific consensus changes. And so the idea, there's also this idea online that scientists should have a debate because maybe science will change from a debate. And it's like, no, it would never change from a friggin' oral conversation. The only way scientific consensus is gonna change is through publication. Yeah. And very careful selection of words, writing it out, what your point is, consciously choosing those words, right? I, I guess when I hear that, it's interesting because I would agree within the science system, especially because science is, is a unique system that it tends to be self-purifying and it has a whole bunch of kind of really hyper conservative policy to make sure that when the changes are occurring, they're directionally in the right direction, right? By and large, there's still errors that occur and whatnot. Um, but we 
we try to mitigate that through discourse and peer review and et cetera, et cetera. But in many ways, like when you look at the political discourse, a single debate, I mean, look at the Biden versus uh, Trump debate or whatever. I mean, that was a single debate that was a spectacle that like changed the course. Mm -hmm. Like these types of things actually, and this is where science is very different from like modern social media is the speed at which like the oral discourse that occurs can just kind of set the trajectory of where things go uh, within a single kind of zeitgeist uh, for the next at least year to couple of months, um, which is maybe something that has to shift amongst like academic brains of being like, no, like you need to understand that every one of these conversations really matter um, because most people aren't going to go back and read all your stuff and do all the discourse and check in a year later to see if it was retracted or anything like that. Um, and so the discourse, you do have to take it really seriously, particularly in the social media field, which is a lot of work for academics who are not being paid to be, even be doing that work. Yeah. No, I, I fully agree. I think that this kind of oral presentation and debates, like whatnot, they, they, especially today, there is so much anti-science, anti-intellectual attitudes out there. And look, our, what I meant by scientific consensus changing from peer-reviewed articles, that is true. If you want to persuade your colleagues, that's the only way to do it. But if you want to persuade the public that what we do actually matters so that we get funds to do our research, so that we have funds to employ good professors and teachers, we need to be able to engage in social media and, and, and oral venues, right, where you're speaking. Because people, that's what they want to hear. Like me, I am very much an academic, so I don't even listen, I now have a podcast, but I, I don't even listen to very many podcasts because I absorb information better by reading it, right? But most people I recognize, they want to listen to it. They want to see it. That's why my podcast is on YouTube because archaeology is very visual. I can show people how we do what we do and I can talk directly to experts and that actually persuades people, right? And that's good because we should be persuading people that what we do is relevant and it matters. And, and I think all my colleagues should be doing more of that and we should be, as you said, getting rewarded for it. It should be part of our jobs. We should have time to do this. That is extremely valuable and it's something that, that where academia is failing very, very miserably because it does not reward this at all. One of the big uh, like shifts in frame that I've had over the past year um, <clears throat> as I've done like more reading on, on, on water topics is the idea that it, it, we have this idea that we have to try really, really, really hard to make somebody memorize a fact or learn a thing about some particular time period um, rather than like taking a step back. And the idea is if you look at it in a, in a very macro perspective is almost absurd on its face. Like, how can I make this entire culture or civilization interesting to somebody when it's like, well, it was interesting to all of these people who were all human beings. There has to be something here. Like this was a culture that tons of people engaged in. Like how could, how could it not be interesting, right? Um, and I, for a lot of my reframing on history or a lot of my th thoughts on history, I've kind of like reframed that way. It's like, okay, well, there's something interesting here. If I'm not making it interesting, if I'm not interested in it, I'm failing to understand something because how mm -hmm. can so many other people be captivated by this, live their lives every single day by this? But for some reason, I think it's like a, a huge snooze fest. Yeah, I think that's how we present it, though. I mean, you know, like, again, I think we need to think through how we present our, our research as relevant to today's world. Yes, um, yeah, and, and so, so much in education isn't connected to, because it's like, well, what, like this is important, <laughs> not just because it's like it happened in the past, but it's not like we don't wipe humanity and start over every hundred years. Like no. whatever they did is probably relating to what we're doing today. Like, exactly, yeah. I mean, look, we've all dealt with this stuff. Like I said, I researched ancient climate change. People have had to adapt to climate change in the past. Right now, we are fairly convinced that in ancient Greece, climate change was probably the main driver for the collapse of Bronze Age civilization at that time. And so, you know, my own research looks at how people adapted to that. So the climate gets drier. How does the, how do they adapt their economy? How does that work? How long does it take them? Hint, it takes them like 500 years for them to change how they grow crops and, and manage animals. And what that means is we don't call it a dark age anymore, but for a good generation of scholars, they referred to that 500 year period as a dark age. And so, you know, we, this is something that matters matters right now because we are experiencing very rapid climate change and we need to have conversations about how we adapt to it, about how we mitigate it. And you know, one of my big arguments is, hey, everybody, look out. Because when you look at sort of societal collapses in the past, do you want to know who disappears? The rich and the wealthy. People still survive. We have this concept of collapse where everybody dies at the end of the Roman Empire or at the end of the Bronze Age. Bullshit. 
what happens is elite material culture disappears. We, what that means is there's no more palaces, there's no more gold, there's no more all this kind of stuff that exists, or there's a lot less of it. And so there's no longer this enormous disparity between the haves and the have-nots. Instead, everybody is a have-not if you see what I mean. And so, you know, I even ended this when I was on Joe Rogan talking to Graham Hancock, where it was like, this is what societal collapse is. So if you are rich and you're wealthy and you're paying attention to this conversation, you should be investing right now in adapting to what's going on and mitigating it, because guess who's gonna be eaten? The rich. The, this is so not related, but very related. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, do you know what the red pill is? The red pill. You're was. so much better for not having any <laughs> idea. But basically, there's a whole like generation of like these Andrew Tate esque yeah, figures. Yeah, okay, I do know what it yeah, is. Yeah, and, yeah, and a lot of what they talk about uh, for early uh, like human evolution and everything, or, or early in our civilizations or pre civilization, about how important it was for like men to be able to control resources and to be alpha and blah blah blah. And one of the important parts for this is if you look at uh, how animal groups are structured, I think they always it's like silverback gorillas, and there's one other animal that they always point to. But the one man, no matter how strong he is, is probably always could be able to be killed by like two or three other men. There's, you're never, ever, ever going to be in a situation where you have a Bezos or an Elon Musk in the wilderness. You just, you can't control that many resources without agriculture, without a, you know, some kind of currency, without like hierarchy and structure and all these things that are never really maintained, you know, pre-civilization. And people have this, uh, yeah, people have this really poor understanding of what is climate change or even like nuclear war. These are probably never extinction level events. Mm -hmm. These are like, I've, I don't know how true it is, but I've seen papers, or not, not papers, <laughs> I've seen articles and YouTube videos um, that argue that uh, if the sun were to disappear, humanity could probably continue to some extent because of geothermal warming, because the huh. core of the planet is still alive, right? Like even that level, like there might be some type of humanity that continues. Um, and that, yeah, it's important to, yeah, it's important to be aware of like, well, what's going to happen afterwards? Like, we're not all just going to make on the same way. And we can't, like this weird binary, like, oh, we're either all going to die or we're not going to die. It's like, no, things change gradually over time and you have to be, yeah. Um, all of the ideas around this are so goofy. I mean, one of the huge advantages of humans is we are experts at adapting. Mm -hmm. You go back into the deepest of prehistory, you know, in the evolution of our species, we have evolved to be adaptive. Right? That's why we've spread to every corner of the earth and, and we've, we've then domesticated species and spread those as well. And so that is what we do is we adapt. And so no matter what, climate change continues, we will adapt. It's just a question of how painful that adaption, adaptation is gonna be, right? Is it gonna be something where there's gonna be a ton of pain or like, like it was at the end of the Bronze Age because it took them 500 years to reform their economy or is it gonna be something that we think through because we're smart and we're intelligent and we can see this coming, so therefore we're gonna start adapting right now. And we are, but we need to adapt quickly because this is happening very quickly, as we all know, because it's friggin' hot out, right? And so, you know, I think that adaptation is really important, but I also think there's this kind of simplistic view on humans. Like you mentioned this idea, oh, big strong man, da 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 That's, that's totally bullshit, nobody believes that anymore. That is like totally antiquated research on man, the hunter and stuff like that, which none of our evidence points towards anymore. What we see that, that, that sort of stimulates human evolution is cooperation. Language. Yeah. yeah. You said that uh, as climate change and like kind of like these major crises hit cultures, elite material culture ends is what you said. Um, but diminishes my, maybe is a better diminishes. term. Diminishes. Yeah, yeah. um, but also that flips and converse. I think I... Political scientists often say whenever you make a policy that creates like disenfranchisement, it typically impacts the poorest the most first. So when you're saying elite, like elite material culture ends, you're not saying that like Jeff Bezos would be the one to die. Uh, you're saying that like the thing that Jeff Bezos values would die. Is, am I understanding you correctly? Yeah, I, I guess the point is, is there's this idea that exists that the wealthy are going to escape. You see all these articles online about uber wealthy people building bunkers. Right. And there's this idea that they actually think that they can outsmart this change that's happening right now to our climate, to our society and things like that. And what I'm trying to say is if you want to actually learn from history, the elites never make it make it out. Right. They, they, they get screwed just like everybody else in a real situation of actual societal collapse. What we see is that and. and I also got to nuance the term collapse because, you know, there's a huge conversation going on right now in anthropological, sociological, archaeological literature about what actually is collapse. And most of us, including myself, are actually more along the lines that it's a transformation. 
So what you're seeing is societal transformation. When the Roman Empire ends, what we don't see is just everybody dying. We see society transforming. There's different roles. There's different ways in which people express themselves, right? And so, but what we do see is there, especially in these periods that we oftentimes think of as collapse, is the reason we think of it as a collapse is because archaeologically speaking, you get elite material culture. You get monuments. You get wealth. That's what's visible in the archaeological record. So during a period of major transformation or collapse or whatever you want to call it, that's the kind of stuff that disappears. But there's still everyday people around. There's still people living, right? And uh -huh. surviving and farming and whatnot. You know, when the Roman Empire collapses, what you see is the end of major cities and people move out to the rural countryside. And so, you know, you do, we do these surveys through farmland today and we collect pot sherds and everything like that. And after the end of the Roman Empire, you see pot sherds all over the countryside because people abandon the cities and they go to the countryside. And so, you to know. survive. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As, as their society transforms, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, the, I, I just want to drop a comment for something you just mm -hmm. mentioned. There. Um, I, kind of, I went to school for music for a few years, so I have a slight background in music. But um, the, a lot of people look at older society stuff, uh, at least as far as music goes, and people assume that uh, the average person was always listening to Beethoven and Chopin, and these are like just the musics of all of the everyman or whatever. And what you just said there about, well, a lot of this is like, uh, curated by elites um, for a lot of the old music. I wish I could remember the two terms. It's like cultivated versus folk or curated versus folk or something. Um, but the idea is a lot of this older music was actually literally directly commissioned by kings and by aristocrats and by royalty. And so sometimes people look at, they'll look at music today and go, well, back in the day, everybody enjoyed, you know, Beethoven and all of these, you know, rock, mind and off. It's like, no, these were like elites listening to music and to pretend that like our taste and everything is dramatically devolved or whatever. It's just not a true retelling of of what's happened historically. And for stuff that has survived that different people do enjoy, uh, or, or for stuff that has survived, you know, that was commissioned by people like Shakespeare, um, that stuff had a lot of layered humor in it for everybody in class, yeah, to enjoy. For, you know, humor for the elites, humor for the, the plebeians and everything else, yeah. I yeah. think that's exactly correct. I mean, you know, so before coming here, I listened to your guys' conversation with Mr. Beat, right? Mm -hmm. And he's talking about how he's very interested in presidential history and stuff like that. And I think, you know, from my perspective on archaeology and, and ancient history, at least, there's been a huge shift away from just studying the elites, right? You know, you think about the history of Rome, and it's a history of one emperor after another after another. But like, my own research, I study food trash. I study like the broken up bits of animal remains that people ate. And so my entire goal is not to study the, the, the fancy sculpture and stuff like that. I'm trying to study everyday people. And there's been a huge shift. It's oftentimes called a shift towards a subaltern approach, where what you're trying to look for is what life was like for everyday people, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the major shifts in archaeology and history is how can we look at the more mundane sources, put together these big, you know, I've studied like a million animal bones. How do we get these big data sets and what can they tell us about people, right? And not just these uber wealthy the elite leaders. people, right? The, when I was doing a lot of uh, Israel, Palestine, that's like a subject that I've spent like eight months uh, reading. I noticed when I debate a lot of people um, in this area, people are very quick to, to say, well, we can talk about this entire conflict or this entire war or this pre-war period because of like this quote or this quote. And I'm like, Let's say in 50 years, somebody wanted to talk to you about the economy today. Would you accept a single quote from Joe Biden or from Donald Trump about how the economy is doing? No. Like, clearly we need more information <laughs> here. You, you probably wouldn't even accept a handful of, you wouldn't accept a state of the union even, no. would you, right? Yeah, of course no, not, no, yeah. No. But, but when it goes further back, I've always felt like people's biggest issue with history is at some point, I would say maybe 80 years, people become aliens, right? Like, what were the people in World War II thinking? Like, I have no idea. It's like, how could you not? What do you mean? <laughs> or even like, you know, the people that built these monuments and, you know, in, in Greece and Rome and the pyramids, it's like, I, I have no idea. Like these people are crazy. They're just, these are, they're, you're the same thing. <laughs> they're people like us. Yeah. And, and you know, I actually, so one of my catchphrases is the truth is in the trash. Mm -hmm. And so what this comes from is in the 1970s at the University of Arizona, there was this big garbology trash project and it was designed to look at modern archaeology. And so what they did is they went door to door and they'd ask you, do you want to take part? It's all anonymous. What I'd like you to do is fill out a survey of what's in your trash and then I'd like you to give me your trash and we're going to compare the two. And it turns out we all lie. 
We all lie to ourselves. So people claim that they eat more healthy food and less junk food than they do. They drink less booze than they do. This is in the 70s. They consume less paper pornography th than they actually do. And so the reality is if you want to look at what somebody is, you don't listen to what they say. You don't look at what they post on social media, right? What do we post on Instagram? We post ourselves when we look good. Our highlight reels. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if you want to see what you really are, look through your trash can. And I wouldn't suggest actually doing that because it's illegal, but that's the reality of what people are. And so, you know, we have this idea of history where we want to listen to what they've written down and what they've said. But if we want to see the nitty gritty of what people were doing, we got to look at their trash because that's what it is. Is there any bias that would come from just looking at, like I'm thinking of my own life, like I'm trying to think about how an archaeologist would look at my trash 200 years from now and like analyze me. Um, I guess, is there any bias that would occur? Because the things that I'm going to throw out and like have as garbage are going to be different than the items that I like prize and value and never throw out, obviously. So how do you, how do you as an archaeologist kind of balance those two things of like the everyday modicum of trash, but also not seeing all of the stuff that they prize, um, especially stuff that might degrade. And I, that's also one of the key points when I talk about this, because I, I, I have a big project where I, I do a data analysis of animals in ancient Greek texts versus animal bones, right? And in animals in art and stuff like that. And so, you know, there's such a huge dichotomy. For example, you know, if you go and read the Iliad and the Odyssey or you read ancient oh. Greek texts. <laughs> <laughs> do you not like them? I hated these. It's horrible, boring, You should check terrible. out some of the new translations okay. by Emily Wilson. They're really, they're really much more accessible. I'll just keep rewatching the Brad Pitt movie where he plays. <laughs> that works uh, too. Yeah, I'm good on that. But uh, so the reality is, when you look at these ancient Greek heroes, right, they're having huge barbecues on giant cattle. Right? That's what they talk about. Even on Athenian pots, the most common animal that they eat, food animal, is cattle. But when you go look at their animal bones, it's all sheep and goat. And so, you know, like what they're doing is they, they prize one thing, like you're saying. There's a, so you learn two different spheres of society. You learn about what they value and how they want to present themselves. And you also learn about what they're doing, you know, on an everyday sort of basis. It's their Facebook. Yeah. It's sort of like, yeah, I think it's important to not throw out that stuff, but you also need to realize if you go far, far enough back in prehistory, you don't have any texts. So you, you're stuck with just the trash. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of... Like the Odyssey and the Iliad. I'm so sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh. Jeez, man. I think because no. those both started as oral <laughs> tradition, right? I think you they were really spoken. want to go at it, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I want to fight today. Imagine looking at some like the most like historic ancient literature and being like, ah, garbage. I so prefer... What's your favorite book? Yeah, literally anything over that. <laughs> Even more modern stuff. I really We're prefer, modern people. I we can teach Kurt Twilight. Vonnegut, okay? We can do Albert Camus, we can do all of these, but God, Gilgamesh. Why not just Twilight? And, try, you know, if you want to, go for it, yeah. Into Fifty Shades, yeah. You should give some of these new translations a try. They're meant for, like, a modern audience. And I probably is, appreciate it more being older now. And, uh, back then, I was just, I was a, a wee high school lad, so. And, you know, look, back in the 20th century, 19th century, there was a, an idea that these kind of classical texts, they need to be presented in this kind of pompous way. Right? And so that's, I think, what leads towards a lot of people thinking, uh, but that wasn't how they were to the people in the past, right? Uh -huh. And so a lot of a new approach to translating these is to try to make them more accessible and understandable for people to, to focus on the story and not, I don't know, d uh, dressing it up in fancy verbiage, if you will. Yeah. Like, There's, you know? when I'm doing, when I'm reading old stuff, especially, um, we've been doing a lot of U.S. histories that go through Supreme Court cases of Federalist Papers and stuff. Like, the assumption that I start with is you probably don't care, so I'm going to try to make you care, because this is, this is, this is really interesting. It's really cool. There's a reason why our government is structured the way that it is, and they literally write about it, and you know, like, why do we have the two-party system? Why do we, why is the president one guy that we elect separately? Like, there's really good reasons for all of this, and they wrote about it, and they argued about it, and they have, like, all, we can read all of it. There's, it's all in writing. It's all, like, recent, pretty recent history. You know, I don't have to dig up a bone and try to guess 4,000 years ago what happened. Like, it's all here. Um, yeah, but... The, We're not guessing. <laughs> well, no, yeah, sure, not, yeah. But I'm just saying in terms of, like, um, I'm not envious of, of people that do, like, doing the history of Israel and Palestine is just nice because it's like we're starting in like like 1880 at the latest as opposed to having to go back to like you know Roman or you know like early well, Egypt it's like so much more difficult to get a, like a better picture of like what's going on for everything not that it's impossible but yeah. but some of the big debates over Israel and Palestine even go back to ancient history sort of thinking sure. through like where do the Palestinian people come from right mm -hmm. and so you know were they there for a long time yeah and, but it's and, nice when I can go to like 1937 and go like oh look I've got census data yeah <laughs> it's like, yeah you know yeah but we do 
have evidence for people that, that modern Palestinians are probably descended from uh -huh. living in that region for, you know, the last few thousand years. Uh -huh. And so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of research on that of the history of people. And that that very much gets built into modern politics, especially in sort of, you know, I don't I, I hate calling it the old world because that's stupid. But in, in Europe, in the Middle East and stuff like that, the there's a real relevancy to history from a few thousand years ago because they modern nation states use that ancient history to claim rights over land. Yeah. And so there is a lot there. And me working in the Balkans, that's something that's always ever present in my mind. You know, I work in Greece, but my wife is Albanian. And so, you know, understanding how these sort of politics get in play um, in this region is really important because a lot of former archaeologists ignored that. And then they made a lot of missteps, you know, and they, they didn't realize that their research is being incorporated into modern political debates. And so we need to be very conscious about that today. I hate that. I want to. I want to ask you a is. bunch about trash. I never thought I was going to sit down with a, a PhD uh, archaeologist and ask about trash. I'm trying to think about. Imagine our trash right now, a thousand years from now. What lasts? What does it tell you? What are you looking for in trash to kind of extrapolate to understanding? I imagine the culture and the people that created the trash. And also, I'm curious. How do you make the up for the gap of all the stuff that's perishable that is no longer in the trash, like our Kleenex and stuff like that. Um, so basically analyze our trash right now, a thousand years from now. More of it's going to survive than you think. Okay. But it's going to be much more mishmash than it was from 2,000 years ago, and that's because of our modern landfills. So this same University of Arizona project, it sort of developed this field of garbology, where people go and they excavate landfills and stuff like that to try to analyze modern society today. And one of the big results out of that is the way that we deposit our trash, and this actually makes a lot of sense archaeologically, is because we're depositing it so fast, it's burying rapidly, it's no longer exposed to the environment, even things that normally would not preserve, like organic remains, they are surviving much, much longer than they would if they're, say, dropped on the street. And so much more of our trash is surviving. And that's actually a problem because we're filling up the world with trash that's not able to decompose because of the way that we're doing it, right? And so that's a huge issue. Um, so more of it will survive. And a lot of stuff in particular, you know, uh, it depends on where it's deposited as well. So kind of like even from the past, we like things like organic remains like wood or plant material, it doesn't usually survive survive. But in the right places, it does. So in waterlogged environments, like let's say the bottom of a well, you're going to find a lot of that stuff or in, in, in a marsh or a lake or stuff like that. In really dry environments, it'll also survive. So like in deserts and stuff like that. And so that's actually how we sort of put together and understand what's perishable and not around versus what's not. It's when we have these more unique contexts where things survive, like in our landfills, a lot of stuff's going to survive. But right here, a lot less is going to survive, if you see what I mean. Because when this building ends up collapsing, things are going to be exposed and, and it's going to decompose. And so what you need to do is work from analogy in that case. Um, but in the end, it becomes an issue of kind of big data. What do these statistics tell us? You know, we'll be able to see trends in cars or Coke bottles or whatever whatever it is, how they change over time. And then we'll try to link that to the history where all of a sudden people are interested in kind of muscle cars where it has this curve to it, where it looks like muscles, right? And that's sort of a, again, virtue signaling, right? Or, or we're going to be looking at changes in the materials that we use to produce stuff as we become more conscious of the fact that our trash has an impact on the environment. And so we'll be able to say, oh, in these areas, they're doing that. In these cultures where they don't care, they're not doing that, right? And so people who are environmentally conscious are doing a different thing with their trash, if you see what I mean. And so I, I think we'll be able to say a lot more than you'd imagine, okay. if you see what I mean, yeah. yeah. I feel like the trend part is really important. I think people don't realize sometimes how much in their life can correlate with other things that they have no idea. I always recommend when people have issues with like uh, feeling depressed sometimes or whatever, having a mood tracking app mm -hmm. can like show you a lot of really surprising patterns. Like, oh, every time this person is around in my life or uh, you know, if you're a woman, like I didn't realize my cycle is impacting me like this much on these days or that you could just like find like really crazy patterns. I started thinking about this more a long time ago when there was a story of I think a lady got mailed some like a like it was like offers for prenatal vitamins or something from Target and it was because her buying pattern had changed such that their system had picked up that she might be pregnant and I think huh. she didn't even know that I think she figured it out because she got this out and then she was like what the fuck and then she ended up taking a test and figured it out or whatever um, 
And, and the idea that I bet you could go through somebody's trash and just find that like, oh, like crazy, uh, you know, you bought a lot of ice cream, you know, like two months ago over the period of a week. Oh, this was a major breakup, right? Like there's just like probably really random crazy things you'd never expect to be correlated that end up being surprisingly well correlated in, in somebody's garbage, yeah. I think you're very right. I think that we are always gonna have blinders on about who we are. You know, it's just not possible for us to fully grasp who we are. Even the most self-conscious person out there is, is not going to understand everything that they do. And that's just life. And, uh, but I also think that with archaeology, we need to understand that we're not studying individuals. We're studying trends and patterns and, and, and you know, groups of people rather than specific individuals. We rarely get a snapshot at an individual. The best case is usually when we have that individual themselves buried. Their grave goods, by the way, are usually a reflection of their culture, not themselves, because you're not, you know, you don't actually choose what you're buried with, your loved ones do, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, what you're buried with is a reflection of your loved ones and what they choose to bury you with. But your own bones and teeth and stuff like that, that captures your diet, that captures your health, that can even capture where you've moved in the course of your life um, because of different geological signatures in your teeth, for example. And so that's a lot of what I do, isotopes. And so that's going to capture who you are on a more individual level. And we sort of call them like, you know, biographies or artifact biographies we sometimes have or, or you know, animal biographies. I study animals. So you can sometimes do that. Um, but most of the time we're capturing sort of more cultural trends mm -hmm. over time and place, space. Yeah. Could I ask what are some really common archaeological study like methodology? methodological obstacles. So for example, in psychology, major obstacle we have is it's all self-report a lot of the time and it's unethical to do much more because you can't crack heads open of live people and stick electrodes in there and see what goes on. That's why human brain and organoids are probably going to be the biggest thing that like jump us forward in psychology because they're basically human brains you can stick electrodes into. Um, does archaeology have really similar kind of methodological limits that just naturally occur within it that you come up against? And I'm curious what those are. Yeah, I think the biggest one is it's it, so archaeology, it, 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 it's really the most interdisciplinary field there is because we study humans in the past. And so, you know, like me, I, I integrate a lot of biology and chemistry into what I do. But other people, they integrate languages and arts and, and stuff like that. Other people use astronomy or physics or, you know, geology, computers. Any single uh, discipline of human knowledge can contribute to archaeology. And so what that means is it's such a diverse field that sometimes we're talking past one another, if you see what I mean, and we're using slightly different methods here in there and so what that creates is is this situation where everything's very variable and it's difficult to sort of uh, standardize everything and on, on a similar related uh, point as a sort of you think of it as a science a science is meant to be deductive right you sort of develop a hypothesis you test it you try to do it in a controlled way to limit the variables we do do that, of course. When you go and excavate a site or perform a study, you present a hypothesis and then you test it by doing your excavation or your isotope analysis on remains or whatever it is. That's actually how you get funding. That's how you get permits and stuff like that. You have to be very hypothesis building and testing to do it. But at the same time, you're getting, when you excavate a site or you do these analyses, you're getting a ton of other data that's unrelated to your hypothesis. And so in that sense, it's also inductive. And so you have to still describe that data, you still need to explain it, you need to come up with a new hypothesis that might be tested or somebody else will. And so it's this kind of uh, difficulty of, of, of combining an inductive and a deductive approach that really limits what we can say, if you see what I mean. And we need to always be cognizant of that. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I think, the two biggest challenges, especially the standardization. And, I, and to, to, to get around some of this, a lot of what we do is we leave material for the future. So we know that people, you know, scholars in 50 years are still going to be interested in excavating this site. So we make sure that, you know, we're excavating using this sampling procedure to answer these questions. There's still unexcavated portions where you can excavate it in a different way with new technologies, new sampling procedures to answer different questions, if that makes Interesting. sense. Interesting. Okay, so you actually like leave some of essentially the data and the um, sample that you're studying unturned yeah intentional that's super fascinating that's a very very like different kind of scientific approach than obviously something that i'm more exposed to in psychology and cognitive science um when you say standardization is tricky i know a really common problem that happens again i'm just going to keep self-referencing psychology but um are, have you heard of positive psychology 
Mm. It's like a new branch of psychology. And one of the biggest things that started, it was uh, started by, I think, Seltzman or Seltzman or whatever. Um, and when he started positive psychology, it's basically looking in, psychology is very concerned with what goes wrong in people. And positive psychology is trying to go, well, what goes right? Okay. That's what positive psychology is aimed at. And so we have the DSM-5, for example, that really standardize what goes wrong with people. We've got pathologies and we've got language for all of that stuff, which kind of gives us a common thing to operationalize around. Whereas in positive psychology, the first thing that uh, the founder said is like, we've got to operationally defined words like well-being, words like flourishing, um, which feel more abstract and woo-woo, but they need to have very specific definitions that can be operationalized and measured. Otherwise, we're not doing science anymore. Um, do you guys have similar issues of like language usage within the field? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. I mean, this is why one of the first things I said on Joe Rogan with Graham Hancock is we don't really use the term civilization anymore because that 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 term is meaningless everybody has a different definition and so you know it just it doesn't it doesn't apply to what we actually study on a regular sort of basis and it has this implication of uh, civilized versus uncivilized which therefore is a value judgment if you see what I mean on people and so we've really moved away from a lot of terms that that a lot of people think we use mm -hmm. um, but also God there's so many debates over how to define various things I'm sure and it doesn't stop and same thing with methods and I mean, you know, some of this is good. We all have different research questions and we do need to apply our own methods to things. But at the same time, we want to try to be standardized so that my inductive results can be compared with your inductive results from which we can build de uh, deductive hypotheses to test things. Right. And so we do try to standardize to some degree methods and stuff like that, but there's different schools of thought on how to do that within different sub-disciplines, like even zooarchaeology studying animal remains, S extremely scientific. It's applying biology and anatomy and, and, chemi and organic chemistry to stuff, but we still have different schools of thought on how to describe and how to do things. And I wish people would, or would we finish? I was gonna say, I think my way of doing things is the best way though. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like when it comes to analyzing uh, basically anything, you have different tool sets mm -hmm. and some are good for some things and some are bad for other things. And it's really hard to get people to kind of adopt that method of thinking. Rather, it's like, this is the one way to do everything and this gives you the answer to everything. And I find that people that operate that way, um, I don't know if I would say more of like an orthodoxy. I don't know if that'd be appropriate to say, but it's oftentimes in the political world, it's a very peculiar thing that I'll find that your particular political ideology happens to explain every single ill in the world. Like if I'm talking to a, a radical hardcore feminist, patriarchy will explain climate change. Or if I'm talking to a hardcore alpha red pill guy, um, you know, feminism is the reason why men kill themselves or like every and every single ill will be explained by their particular transcendental idea. This is the reason why everything happens. Um, yeah, and it's very frustrating sometimes to get people to understand or to adopt this more idea. That, like sometimes it's good to analyze things one way because you can get this information and other times you can analyze things this way and you get different types of information and none of it is like necessarily good or bad. There might be like an inappropriate tool to use to effect some end or to accomplish some goal. Um, but like there's always some type of information you can gather and it's good to be aware of like the limits of all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, look, the field of archeology, span especially in the last, what, 20 to 30 years has really moved towards context dependent questions and analyses. And so, you know, there was this big goal in the seventies and eighties that we must standardize and do everything the same way, but then new methods get developed, different questions get developed. When you're studying, you know, animal bones from a paleolithic cave of hunter gatherers, you're going to have a wide variety of different questions than you are if it's from ancient Athens, right? Or from 19th century America, right? And so, you know, we need to be asking questions that fit the context. And that's also why we always want to leave stuff for future scholars, whether it's material or artifacts and stuff like that or, or unexcavated portions. It's because the kinds of questions we ask have to define the kind of studies that we do. There's no one right way to do something. There's a lot of different right ways to do stuff, if you see what I mean. There's a concept that uh, you just brought up that's so hard even to get, or I don't know if your perception, maybe it's different in archaeology, but even for science people to understand this, the idea of like normativity preceding epistemics, the idea that you're making a value judgment before you've even begun like an intellectual exploration. Uh, one of the most frustrating things, sometimes academics do this, people that do pseudoscience always do this, but people will say things like, um, I just, all, we just need to know the facts. The only thing that matters is the facts. Like we need to do a completely an objective mm -hmm. analysis of the facts with no moral, no value statements whatsoever. We just need to object. And it's like the fact that you're even asking a particular question, right? Do you want to know how high an amoeba can jump? 
Like you're not asking <laughs> that question. You're saying, can this drug cure a person? Well, why? Yeah. Probably because you think there's some value in exploring that line of thought, right? Or you're asking, you know, what what caused these people to follow this particular leader, or why did the society collapse? I, I imagine it's because you can gain some kind of useful information. Very rarely do we pursue fact for fact purpose, right? Usually there's like a guiding thing there. And yeah, it's, it's really hard to get people to understand sometimes that there's a whole load of normativity of, of ethical value judgment that precedes even asking any objective question. Um, it's kind of like tying back to what you said earlier that we can't see all of ourselves. I mean, by definitionally, we're subjective beings. Right? We mm -hmm. can't observe ourselves. And yeah. Um, yeah. I think you're exactly right. And I think that's something that archaeology, just like a bunch of disciplines, have struggled with uh, for the last like 30, 40 years, right? How do we understand that, look, our goal is to understand the world around us in an objective way where we can all have a shared understanding of it. But at the same time, we're all struck in our subjective sort of way of looking at it. And at the same time, even the very definitions, as we brought up, that we use, the way we define what is a fact or not is, is going to be reflective on our own values uh -huh. and our own questions. And so, you know, that's not easy, but that's just the world around us. The world around us is fucking messy. You know, it just is. And we need to be better at accepting that, that there is no real objectivity, if you see what I mean. Everything is biased through how we see it, through our own eyes and our own language and our own culture. And so that, but that's a good thing. That, that's part of what human variability is, you know? I'm super curious, what are hallmarks of kind of pseudo-archaeology? I know in, uh -huh. in, in psychology, we learn like the six tenets of obvious markers of pseudoscience, and I can't remember all six, so I'm sorry, professor. Um, what in, how do you tell specifically with archaeology, especially as a lay person, what are like little flags that we can look at being like, mm, this is sus, you know? What are the sussy flags of pseudoscience in archaeology? Yeah. Um, so to think about it from a professional point of view, I would say that it's people who have no experience with archaeology that are pretending they know more than experts, if you see what I mean. So someone like Graham Hancock, he claims, why do people call me a pseudo-archaeologist? I never claim to be an archaeologist. I claim to be a journalist who studies prehistory. So calling me a pseudo-archaeologist is flawed. But the reality is, is he's out there saying, everything archaeologists say is wrong and my idea is right. And so, you know, that to me is, is, is one of the key hallmarks. It's someone who's not an expert, but is claiming experts are wrong. You know what I mean? So that's, that's flag number one. Um, and, and they don't need to claim to be an expert. They're not, they're, they're, what they're doing is they're presenting archaeology or science in a convincing way without actually having that background. They're and, double dipping. Yeah. What they're doing is they get the, the privilege of making the extraordinary claims, but they can always retreat back to the, well, I'm just a guy asking questions. Girl. Exactly, yeah. JAQ, <laughs> jacking off, if you will. Yep, so all yeah. the credibility, none of the accountability. And so that's, that's what I'd say the first hallmark. And that distinguishes, of course, between somebody who's not an expert, but still believes in experts, right? So you have all these people on YouTube who are not archeologists, but they're still presenting what archeologists publish. And they're doing a great job. I love those people, right? And so, but it's the people who are, claiming archaeology is wrong. Um, but but then, have you ever considered that all archaeologists are compromised in the entire field so they can't <laughs> trust experts? I mean, I think we are compromised. You know, we're just lying. <laughs> I now have all these people that think I lie. You're making this, a job for this is what This is what it is. They're like, Flint Dibble is a liar. He went in there and presented XYZ, and it's just, they, they pull out the most random thing. It's like, uh, what was it? At one point, Joe Rogan asked me a random question about, because I was talking about the domestication of crops and how we can clearly date that, you know, or organic evidence, we can radiocarbon date it, it's directly datable. And so, you know, we can see when crops are domesticated, there's no ice age civilization that's growing crops, right? And so he says, well, what about feralization? And so I'm like, yeah, that, uh, you know, that would probably take as long as domestication does a few thousand years. And he keeps pressing me and I say, but look, I don't know. I, I, I really do not know. Um, I've not studied this. I don't even know if people have studied how long it takes for feralization to happen in an archaeological framework. That's when something is domesticated and becomes uh, feral. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And, and this one guy on YouTube who's a Graham Hancock fan, he takes out the first half of that where I say it probably takes a few thousand years. And then he says I lie. And it's like, dude, the very next sentence, I say, I don't know. And I say, actually, I've not researched this. I'm clearly not friggin' lying. So that's, that's another key thing is, you know, when they accuse us all of being compromised or lying or something like that, when really, I just like archaeology and I want to share it. Like, that's legitimately my only motivation. I am an underpaid scholar. I make fucking peanuts, right? And so, you know, what is my motive to lie? They claim I'm going to get more grant money. 
I don't get grant money for going on a podcast. Like, you really think that any granting agency is going to care that I was on Joe Rogan or that I'm here talking to you guys or anything like that? They're not going to give two shits. I get grant money based on my hypotheses, the ways I'm going to test them, and the results I'm going to get from those kind of tests and whether they're valid or not. Me talking to the public does not help me get grant money. It doesn't help me get paid more. It doesn't do anything in that sense. And so... And what's even more frustrating is that's not true on the other end. Yeah. Because the other end is making all of their money. Like how much money, if you, your bread and butter was, I'm saying it dismissively, but conspiracy theory, how much money would you get if at the end you were like, you know what? I did a lot of interesting research and you know, I think it probably was 6 million actually. That is how many Jews died I think in the Holocaust. Well, there goes your entire audience. They're not gonna listen to you anymore. And the idea that, um, what did I hear? I think, it was, I think it was Tim Pool that said it. He said something like, I think it was him, something like, People say there were audience captured, but what they don't realize is we are like completely funded by our audience. They pay um, all of our donations. They're like, we don't have any corporate sponsors. And it's like, well, that's like the definition of audience <laughs> capture, yeah, my exactly. man. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's very familiar, I mean, you know, even Graham Hancock, he's an old school content creator. He, he sells his books, mm -hmm. right? And stuff like that. And, and he's, he, he, he talks about how his research is fully self-funded. And it's self-funded by his audience, if yeah. you see what I mean, that they are doing in, that. Yeah. yeah, that are ideologically captured, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a really good point. And I think that that's also probably a good hallmark of this kind of pseudoscience, if you see what I mean. That is their goal. And, and, and they say it all the time. We're doing this for public opinion. And it's like, I don't do what I do in my job for public opinion. I do it to try to get stuff published, right? I do it to understand and advance our understanding of the past. I'm not trying to, you know, in terms of how I get paid, trying to convince the public. I'm trying to convince the public because I believe in what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a big difference there. I very firmly believe that archaeology is important and relevant. And I know for a fact that the public doesn't really understand what we do today because most people never take an archaeology course. You know, you have to be – what – what before university level, what, are you ever offered archaeology as a course? Like you watch Jurassic Park. Yeah, or you, maybe you get a, tr a field trip to a museum, right, yeah. or a local site. So you get a little bit, but you don't take a class in what we do. You have to do that at a university level. So you have to go to university, and you have to choose to take one of those courses, which most people don't. And so, you know, nobody understands what we do today in the 21st century. And so me and other people, even the people that aren't arguing against pseudo-archaeologists, we're trying to share what we do. Because we think what we do is valuable. And that's that's it. That's the reward we get. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think a lot about the uh, like the claim, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And one of the issues that I see for somebody who's not exposed to a field is what is considered extraordinary. Because to a lay person, a whole bunch, I was listening to uh, Minuteman Milo, who will be on with us tomorrow. Yeah. Talking about this TikToker who's doing the, oh, it's gonna be so sad if I don't remember this word. Hyperdiffusion, I think, is what hyperdiffusionism. It's yeah. Oh, I 100%. win. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, where they're like, look at all these pyramids everywhere. How do all these cultures come up with a period with a pyramid? Or like, how do all these cultures have a bird creature that exists as one of the gods? How is this possible if there isn't a generalized civilization? And the problem is like. As a layperson, initially, you're like, that's true. There are a lot of pyramids everywhere. Mm -hmm. The problem is that you don't like have any of the context of what that means. And so extraordinary evidence, I don't even know as a non-archaeology person, what's the bar for considered extraordinary evidence? Because I know in psychology what is considered extraordinary evidence. I know the correlation sizes that are extraordinary versus unextraordinary. And I know the data set size that we would be like, this is as close to fact as we can get in psychology, right? But I don't actually know that. And so it's interesting that like we'll teach people extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, but I hear pseudoscience people say that all the time. And the problem is that nobody actually knows what the metric of extraordinary means in any given field. And how do we disseminate that? Yeah, that's a tough question to answer. Um, I would actually say that one of the major hallmarks of pseudo-archaeology for the public listening around is hyperdiffusionism. in fact. I, I often try not to use that word publicly because it's such a big word. But uh, it's the idea that it, it, another way to call it is this thing looks like that thing. Right? It's where you take two things, artifacts, art, monuments, or whatever, they have a few superficial similarities, and therefore you say, they must come from the same culture. And that's really what hyperdiffusionism is. It's this idea that things around the world, that, oh, they, they talk about birds here and birds there, or a really common one is snakes, you know, cultures. And it's like, come on, birds and snakes 
are all over the world. Why would you expect cultures not to have that as part of their iconography, their religion, their mythology, their stories, their whatever? Of course it's going to be part of it because they're all over the friggin' world. It doesn't mean that they all have the same religion of worshiping snakes and birds and stuff like that. And same thing with pyramids. You know, when you're trying to build something high, you start with something wide, and then you go up, right? It's just a simple way of trying to build a large monument. So of course it's gonna show up in different cultures in different areas of the world. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the key things and a key, uh, you know, red flag for pseudo-archeology span is the, this thing looks like that thing, you know? And it, it, it's, it's just, or hyperdiffusionism, if you will. And so I think, what is an extraordinary claim in archeology? span I mean. I think the key thing is, like I sort of mentioned earlier, is we're now just down at the point of nitty gritty contexts. We're looking at very specific cultures and this idea that we can compare pyramids in what is now Mexico that are dated from like a thousand years ago to pyramids from Egypt that are dated, what, 4,000 years ago. We're talking so much difference in space and time and culture that we need to understand them in their own cultures. We can't be comparing them to each other. We don't do that anymore. That's the kind of thing that people 150 years ago did because they first found these pyramids and we're starting to compare them. But now we've realized that there's such a discipline. We can understand the development of these structures in Egypt. We can see how it develops from mastabas, which are these sort of rectangular tombs. And then the very first pyramid, the step pyramid of Djoser, it starts off as a mastaba and then they expand it into the pyramid. It's just a series of mastabas on top of each other is really what it is, if you think about that. And so in, 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 what we, in Mexico, in Central America, they have a totally different uh, tradition of how that monumental architecture developed. And so it's understanding things in context. That's the real key. Okay, I'm going to tie a bunch of these things together, okay? The, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, the, w w when you bring this up, uh, going back to what we said before, the, the contextual stuff, I think that people intuitively have a very good understanding of this. And it's very frustrating that when certain scenarios come up, people just all of a sudden their mind like wipes. Like you'll listen to two friends talking to each other and it's like, if you go over here, I'm gonna kill you, right? And somebody might say something, you know, like a, a politician is giving a speech and it's like, we need to kill these people. And you might be arguing with somebody who's very politically bought in and you'll be like, how do you think this is okay? And they'll say something like, well, yesterday I just heard you tell your friend you were gonna kill him if he you know, went out without you. So it's like the same thing. It's like, you know that's not true. You know that's not true. Contextually, you you understand this as a, yeah. you have you have to understand this as a human unless you have a brain injury or some severe like cognitive defect because it's like necessary to how we navigate. It's necessary how we use language, right? You don't you don't use anywhere near the amount of words that you need truly to like syntactically convey an idea. Like if I walk into a room and I say, are you hungry? Like there's so much implication there that I'm asking you if you wanna go out to eat, I'm implying we probably do something together. It's probably gonna be soon. If I just walked in and asked if you were hungry and you said, yeah, and then I left, that'd be like really confused up for my own edification. Um, yeah, it's one of those things that people like understand, um, they understand intuitively, but the social pressures or whatever ideological capture they're suffering, they get totally bought into. And then it shuts down that logical part of their brain. Something that's been very frustrating for me to deal with is um, there's a lot of stuff that I try I try to embody in how I approach uh, my online political debate, discourse, research, or whatever. And all of it, I tell my audience constantly, like everything I say is a huge red flag because there's so much that is worn as an aesthetic that there's mm -hmm. no relation whatsoever to the thing itself. So like, I would say I try to do a lot of my own research. Um, I try to do, I try to be relatively nonpartisan. I try, but anytime I hear somebody say these things, I'm immediately thinking like, you're the biggest partisan hack fuck in the world. <laughs> you do your own research, really? Tell me the last paper you read. You do your own <laughs> research, you watch a variety of media sources. Do you really, or did you see all of these things brought up on Joe Rogan? What did you actually do? Um, so many people will use a thing as an aesthetic, um, even when you talk about like critical thinking. And these are like very quickly when I'm arguing with people, it's like, when you you say critical thinking what do you mean and they're like it's always like well i read a variety of sources how do you how do you tell what's good or what's not good it's like i don't know i talked to like they don't actually have any there's no actual answers like how do you how do you metacognitively audit your thoughts so that you know you're not falling into these stupid pitfalls right um and then you because you bring up this idea of how do you know what an exceptional idea is or not um and i and i i hate this but i feel like the only way to really know is to have like a working vocabulary in a, in a field, and once you've developed that working vocabulary, immediately you can tell, and this, and, and again, this is actually a thing we all intuitively know, like if somebody, um, if somebody was, uh, if somebody was watching a game, if I were to say something like, uh, like I'm watching an NBA game, I was like, oh my God, that ball slam he did was awesome. And like, what do you mean? It's like when he jumped up and he slammed the ball in the hoop. <laughs> 
You've, okay, you've never watched a basketball. Like you would immediately know that from me, right? <laughs> the ball um, slam. Yeah, and I can do that. <laughs> that yeah. sounds like something totally different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And historically, yeah, for Israel Palestine, the thing I've studied a lot of. You know, somebody's like, well, how did they feel in '47 when whoever said whatever about the partition plan? It's like, well, in 1927, this guy said this, and it's like. That was 15 years earlier. It's a much different time. The yeah. fact that you would even cite that, and I'm sure archaeologically there are things that people say, and you're like, okay, you're fucking lost, right? Um, it's very hard to understand immediately and intuitively what is an extraordinary claim because it might sound like, oh, that's possible, but there, are, it, there it's a common like computer programming joke too, where like, oh, like how, like I just want to change this thing on the homepage, like make this a different color, and it's like, oh, that's easy. Okay, I also just want to have a part where like a user can enter their name, and that shows up like in the top right if they're logged in. Okay, I need like six weeks for that. Yeah, well, it's just a name and the color. How is it different, right? Um, all of this to, to go back to, um, I'm trying to tie things you guys have been talking about together. Um, all of this going back to one of the most important things I've realized over the past several years, especially through my watching of Jordan Peterson is, I don't necessarily value people who are right all the time or people who are wrong all the time, but I, I place a huge amount of respect and value on people that can hedge their convictions appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, I've, I'm at the point to where for the past like year or so on stream, I try to say like, I think that this is probably not the case. I'm giving you this at like 15% though. I don't actually know fuck all about this. <laughs> so I, I think it's probably this, but I don't actually know, right? Whereas it's something I'm very confident about. There's like 90% sure that what I'm saying here is true. Like my tone of voice might be similar, but I'm trying to give like an actual number because I don't yeah. actually know this thing. Yeah. In terms of like healthy, uh, yeah, yeah, healthy conversational or like intellectual practice because um, a lot of times people don't realize, I think one of the most important things is just to know what you don't know or to understand the limits of, of what you're saying. And then on, on the last thing, I'm hitting a lot right here. The last thing you said is like, um, constellations aren't real. There's not actually like a dude in the sky. Like you're just drawing lines. Oh, that's some pseudo archaeology. Yeah, <laughs> you're drawing lines be between between stars, and you're trying to make a picture out of a thing. Mm -hmm. And that pre-bunk versus debunk. If I show you a thing, and then after you've seen the thing, I try to argue why it's not that. That's incredibly difficult. If I'm trying to work, and you've already got the pen in your head, and I can even see it when I debate some people, where I already see they have like a dumb idea in their head, and I already know that like if we go into this thing, like. I understand why you think that this is reinforcing your argument, but like, trust me, it's actually the exact opposite. You're, it's not, but it's like, you're already like, F me. Like, I don't like, I, I can already <laughs> tell this is like, it's not Jesus Christ. Cause I know, I know what you have in your head and it's just not right. Yeah. yeah. And that's okay. You, you, you brought a lot here. Mm -hmm. Um, so I actually think that that let's go to the pre-bunk versus debunk. I actually think that's the key thing. Why I wanted to start off with Graham, start off right away, because look, the reason why people believe some of this stuff is because pseudoscientists, they create a new context in which to understand, uh, this material remains, right? Or you can see this with other types of pseudoscience, but certainly for pseudo-archaeology. And so the thing is, is if you let them paint that context first, that's in people's minds and it's gonna stick and you need to draw it out of them and so you know I got this comment probably from 50 different people or read it on reddit or in emails or something like that where it's like as soon as you opened your mouth I, I suddenly realized, even though I've been a Graham Hancock fan for 10 years, I realized exactly why he's wrong. And it's because I went first and I was able to define the context of what archaeology is and how we study it and how we draw inferences about the past, right? And then the way that we can actually be confident in one thing or another. And so I think that sort of setting that context and being the first one to do that, this is why you guys are talking about should intellectuals go and engage in public discourse? Yes, because we need to share our context of the conversations of what we do and why it's relevant and how we do it. We need to inform the public of this context of how science works, of how uh, scholarship works, because it's not all science, of course. And so if we don't set that context really clearly in the public mindset, they are then getting a context of how science and peer review works. It's all gatekeeping and da 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 da, -da. It's like, that's total bullshit. There is no gatekeeping involved. You don't need a PhD to work on archaeology. You don't need a PhD to publish archaeology in a peer-reviewed journal. I know plenty of people without PhDs that I've worked with and that do this kind of stuff. And so- One thing I'll say there though, just real quick on that, in terms of it feeling gatekeepy, if it feels gatekeepy sometimes, it's because there is a there is some base level of understanding you have to get because it reminds me of, um, is it, was his name Terrence Howard? Yeah. The guy that wanted to I, break all of math. And it's like, <laughs> but if you, haven't done, yeah, if you haven't done the bare well, level. One plus one is three or one. Yeah, if you haven't right. done the base level work one to understand to get in there. Yeah, yeah. But sorry, yeah, go but ahead. But people yeah. don't understand what expertise even is, right? This is why like people be like, well, who are you to talk about this thing? You don't have a PhD in it. And it's like the, the, the 
key of the gatekeeping of the education in itself is having that baseline knowledge to engage in the lexicon, to understand what it means when you say extraordinary. Like it's to understand the field enough to be making claims about exactly. it, which anyone can do theoretically. But if you go through the education process, you're probably just most equipped to do so. Yeah, no, 100%. And that's where we think about what's an exceptional idea and just do your own research, right? You. Sorry, guys, you can't just do your own research into a field that has like a long history and a lot of expertise. I mean, you can, but for the first five years, you're not going to know what the fuck you're talking about at all. Mm -hmm. And until you actually go and see what archaeology is like in a trench, in labs and stuff like that, which anybody can do, by the way, there's all kinds of volunteer opportunities for people to do that. And that is how people without PhDs actually end up becoming very competent archaeologists because they start off on a volunteer level, getting their hands dirty and I know plenty of retirees, a lot of retirees do this. You see like 70 year old women, Ann Santin, if you're watching, you're awesome. She's in the trench, she's lifting buckets, she's moving stuff, she's learning about it. She then sits in on graduate level courses mm -hmm. and does all this stuff, does the work without getting a degree because that's not what she's interested yeah. in doing, right? It's that aesthetic thing because you can do your own research, but they never do, yeah. right? You do your own research, okay, who are three publishers in this field? They're, oh, you don't know any, what's the last paper you've read? Oh, you haven't done any, but you have encyclopedic knowledge of the last 15 times this guy was on Joe Rogan? That's not doing your own research, right? Yeah. Well, that's the thing, their, their own research is reading public stuff. It's like reading what a journalist in the New York Times says about, uh, about archeology. span And no offense to the journalists in the New York Times, they are totally transforming what we do for a public audience, right? <laughs> so like- My professors yeah. always said, never it's talk the, to science yeah. journalists about your science. The, I think it's called Gelman Amnesia or whatever. Right, somebody will be really well versed in gaming or computer stuff, and they'll read a New York Times article like, "Oh my God, this is so wrong!" And then they flip the page, and it's like, "This is some good commentary on other fields that I have no idea about." Right? <laughs> exactly. and you forget that it, yeah, yeah. And so you have to be, you know, and 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 you get these pseudoscientists that go and dip in, and they do word searches, and they find like one sentence in one peer reviewed article, and it's like, you know, you're calling me a liar about these ice cores, but the title of the article actually supports what I'm saying, and that's on screen behind you, right? And so it's just like, you got to read the whole article, not just pulling out two words. And there's, so, a, there's a meme that I read before, and it's a stupid meme. And I've, I, I, unironically, I've come around to it. And it was, uh, there was some, it was some author, and I think for his annotations, he just puts books. And I think somebody like, asked him one time, like, you can't, you can't just annotate to an entire fucking book. And I think the response that he wrote was something like, uh, books aren't meant to be quoted. They're meant to be read and understood. And if you don't read and yes. understand the book, and it's like, that's not acceptable for an annotation. But it is true to some extent, because <laughs> the number one way that I found when going through, um, I'll call them pop academics, of which there are countless of them. Um, yes. <laughs> the number one way to debunk any of them is to just buy their work and chase down the annotations because holy Christ, when you see somebody that sources something and then you read the underlying material, like hold on, this is not an accurate summary of this at all. Exactly. And then you find that, yeah, the and um, there are so many things about, at some point I'm gonna make a list of these, or maybe somebody has, there are so many like minor research or critical thinking or epistemic practices where, where the people don't understand. And, and these are things that people kind of and kind of don't intuitively understand. But like, I, I wish I had a snappy way of making somebody understand that if, if I was writing, if you were writing an article about some archeological find in, in, you're in, in Greece and you're doing something and you were to write something along the lines of like um, we traveled to Greece uh, to do this study and I hate, I hate traveling in the morning because there's always traffic, blah, 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 right? If you were to write a piece about what you found there, if I was somebody who was a civil engineer and I wanted to prepare a paper on how I think different traffic systems around the world work, I can't cite your sentence saying that traffic is always busy. Because yeah. that's not what your article was about. You're not an expert there. It doesn't matter that it's a good article that is cited five million times. You get the highest impact score. It doesn't matter. Yeah. That wasn't what your article, and it's so hard to make people, because sometimes when I'm arguing with people, I'll look at like a citation. It's like, why are you quoting this article about this legal topic? And they're like, well, they say here that this is this thing legally. It's like, that's not a legal paper. I don't care about this guy's understanding of this. That's not even what this article is about. How do you not understand that? Yeah. And this is all what goes down to these people create their own context. Mm -hmm. Right? They strip the context of the data that we present, and then they pull it out and create their own context. So this summer, we got to see a new archaeological conspiracy theory formed in real time. Uh -oh. There's this pseudo-archaeologist on YouTube with like 1.5 million subscribers, and he created... His name's Milo Minuteman, by the way. No, no, no. <laughs> Milo's great. Mini Minute Man is fantastic. But, uh, I'm kidding. I'm th kidding. This guy, I'm not going to name him because I don't want to... Uh -oh. deal with him and his subscribers. Um, so he, he, there's this famous site in Turkey 
right? It's called Gobekli Tepe. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's this uh, enormous stone circle built out of megalithic architecture that was discovered in the 90s. Totally cool find discovered by this German professor, Klaus Schmidt. Now Wait, I gotta ask real quick. How does something like this not get discovered until the 90s? Well, technically the site was actually discovered in the 60s with some survey. Okay. Um, and in fact, similar sites were discovered in the 80s and stuff like that. How okay. deep was it underground? Or oh, was it several underground? meters. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 okay. 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 Yeah. I thought it was just above no, ground. No, no, no. Like, Turkey's a pretty... <laughs> okay, no, we, we, I, you know, one of the first projects I worked on in Greece was actually a survey where we found an enormous Mycenaean Bronze Age port that was above ground. Okay. Right? And so there's still stuff like that to be found. And that's why we go and do systematic surveys. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of new stuff to come out in archaeology. It's a <gasps> Sorry, I just had a... I, no, I'm going to write it down. <laughs> so, okay, there's this really cool site, Gobekli Tepe. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and it's so early, it's right after the end of the Ice Age. And so it's actually, we now know, at the time it was thought that because it's at the same time that agriculture develops right nearby, they thought it had something to do with the development of agriculture. Okay. But now that people have sat down and systematically studied the seeds and the bones, we now know these were hunter-gatherers, right? Mm -hmm. And so Graham Hancock and other pseudo-archaeologists on ancient aliens, it's everywhere, this site, it's seen as this, you know, er early civilization type it breaks the mold of archaeology ignoring the fact that we've studied similar sites there's monumental architecture nearby like in Jericho or Tel Sultan as it's called today and uh, you know so this is found so this guy this YouTuber he finds this one little sentence from a news article saying that the World Economic Forum gave a little bit of money to help fund some presentation at the site, like conservation and the roof or something like that. And out of that, he builds this conspiracy theory that the World Economic Forum controls the site, they've shut down excavations, they've planted olive trees over it so that archaeologists cannot keep digging because they want to hide the, the prehistory of humanity here. And this gets picked up. It ends up on InfoWars. Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson discuss it. It's still going right now. It's, it's right now a major thing. It was just in the news yesterday because, so this, this, this started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It started, it moved to Turkey because it got translated into Turkish. And so it, part, it got integrated therefore into archeopolitics there. And so- Archeopolitics. Yeah, okay. you know, the politics of what you're doing archeologically, which <laughs> well, in different countries is gonna be very different. Huge deal, right? sure, yeah. And so this is taking off. And so I, I'm like, all right, we have to think through how to deal with this, right? And like present the truth. So I get in touch with the director of the site, this German guy, Lee Claire, and we, my last YouTube video was an interview with him, where we specifically, we set up what misinformation research would call a truth sandwich, where we started off with some truth, why is Gobekli Tepe so cool and important? Then in the middle, we laid down a slice of debunking. This is, the olive trees were actually planted by the farmer who owned the land, for example, before it was expropriated by the Turkish government. All this kind of stuff. The World Economic Forum is not funding the project or anything. That kind of stuff. Then at the end, we lay down all the new research that's happening there, all the cool new finds that he has over the last five, ten years. And so, you know, and it worked really well. It was my most viral YouTube video. It just ended up creating some news in, in different uh, journal article, uh, journal list articles it was just in what the daily express yesterday uh -huh. and so you know it's like this is how you go about dealing with this but it's just we have to be very careful because people are going to create whatever we do they're going to create their own context and we need to be aware of that and be aware of how to combat that kind of misinformation in real time and so you know we have to deal with that it's really frustrating. One of the things my, my fans, I don't know if this is a real fallacy name, but they call it the uh, the all roads lead to Rome fallacy. Um, somebody else sent me a longer write up of this concept of like a kind of like a, a transcendental idea. One of the annoying things when I deal with some types of conspiracies is there will be this transcendental entity that can actually explain everything. So even evidence that would ordinarily be disconfirming ends up actually just reinforcing the opinion that somebody might have. Uh, I, I think the best example of this is the Andrew Tate stuff. So initially, they were never going to be arrested because all of it was bullshit. Well, then they get arrested. Well, fine, they're never gonna bring charges to them because they're just, it's political. Well, okay, now it looks like they're gonna bring charges to them. And then, well, fine, they're gonna go to court. Now, no matter what happens in court, it will be confirming evidence because if they get convicted, of course they got convicted. It's a sham trial. They're trying to throw the book at these mm -hmm. guys. And if they beat the charges, well, of course they were bullshit in the first place. It was always like the fake news media. And no matter what happens, like, yeah, of course, this big archaeology shill is out here, you know, fighting for That's grant me. money. <laughs> big yeah, archaeology. Fighting for grant money from his, uh, for his university. Paid off. So of course he's out here saying, you know, of course he's gonna protect his own industry and talk about how these trees, like, you do, do you have videos of this guy planting these trees beforehand? Like, you don't know that. Like, isn't it 
convenient that now you guys are talking about the like there's all and it's like jesus christ yeah there's nothing that i can say or do because you will there is no thing that is disconfirming because i, I remember talking to my mom like my mom and dad i love them to death are die hard trump supporters but like you know my mom's like they rig all the elections stevie that's how they won 2020 and that's how why obama it's like how did trump win in 2016 because enough good people came out and fought the system and i'm like well, how? What? <laughs> what? Yeah. No, and I think, uh, you know, talking about hallmarks of pseudo-archaeology, how do you identify it? Universalizing ideas, right? Where it's sort of like, this idea explains all of human history and prehistory, right? Whether it's ancient aliens or an Atlantis lost civilization. If somebody's making a claim that there's one thing that explains all of human history and prehistory, that's pseudoscience. I'm sorry. Nothing we do actually, everything we do rewrites human history and prehistory for sure, but in small incremental ways. Not in this sort of, this is going to change, overthrow the paradigm of history. That's one of Graham Hancock's phrases. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to overthrow the paradigm of history. And it's just like, nothing we do do that. That kind of universalizing idea. And like you said, it's something that self-perpetuates. Even if you sort of change something, oh no, but they'll roll with the punches. It's still there. It still explains it. And it's just like... Sorry, that's just not how it works. And people will simultaneously betray history while trying to appeal to it at the same time. I argue with a lot of far right people. And one of the things that I love about the United States and how diverse we've become is how diverse like the new Nazi movements are. One of my favorite memes on uh, on the internet was like some, I think it's a white dude and then there's like a Jewish guy on the other side and he's about to stab the white guy. And then this like Hispanic arm comes up and grabs him and the Hispanic dude has like a swastika <laughs> <laughs> because it's like so wild. Cause I'm like, you know that like 90% of you guys weren't even considered white like 250 years ago when you said the US was founded as a white country, um, yeah. and like, and then, and then it sounds. Um Without diving too far off into the uh, into the philosophy world, it's very frustrating too because there are so many there are so many concepts that we take for granted, and the second that you even breach that subject, you already sound like you're insane. Like somebody will ask a question and it's supposed to be so pointed, like, well, what is a woman? And it's like, you like, you don't understand how, con like, what is a table? Like the, the Plato's forums and the universalization of concepts, like, do these even exist in it? Like, you're, you're asking a really complicated question and you don't even understand how complicated yeah. the question is. You know, what is like white and black? It's a very complicated question. And, and, mm -hmm. and as stupid as it sounds, like uh, my understanding, at least I'm not big on history, my understanding is that like these concepts are relatively relatively unique in American history in that we brought like to the forefront this very delineated concept of white versus black. Mm -hmm. And when you say like, well, there are no white and black people in the old world, people are like, oh, of course there were. Well, like there were different skin tones, but it wasn't the same thought that we have about like white versus black. Like, yeah, there were different ethnicities and races and where people came from and everything kind of, but it was different. Yeah, people take that yes. for granted sometimes, yeah. And people have this idea, like, you know, the ancient world, the ancient Mediterranean, it's all white people or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, th that could not be further from the truth. The ancient Mediterranean straddles Africa, Asia, and Europe. It includes everybody. There's Roman emperors that come from African families, right? We have art that depicts people that we would call black today, mm -hmm. right? They didn't, call, they didn't have the concept of white and black back then, because that's a very modern colonial concept. And so, you know, but th th there's this picture of the past that everybody has in their mind that really does not match the diversity of the evidence we actually have, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I think one important hallmark of pseudoscience that you kind of talked about is unfalsifiability, right? Like, if, an, if a concept itself is unfalsifiable, it's immediately it's immediately outside of the territory of science. Like it must be, right? This is why like lots of scientists will be like, I don't really wanna talk about God. It's like this unfalsifiable claim. It's just not really the area that science gets into because it's unfalsifiable. There's there's just, we could just be brains in a vat in a, and we'll never know. It's mm -hmm. just not a scientific question. Um, I also think about a lot uh, conspiracy versus like real life. I wanted to ask you um, about uh, specifically disinformation from Russia. Because I feel like there's so many conspiracies that occur that are like wild. But then when you look at real life, you've got things like MK Ultra, or you've got things like um, just this year, El Sevier, which is a, for those who are unaware, is like a major peer review production. Yeah. They, they produce a bunch of peer review and journals and stuff like that. They redacted over 10,000, I don't know if you saw the article, 10,000 articles this year alone. And the number one contributor to scientific fraud it was a lot of scientific fraud was russia mm -hmm. um one of the biggest contributors i don't know have you seen that video of the girl going around that got beaten at the trump rally oh right <laughs> and it's <laughs> wait um, i'm so sorry hold on it sounds like i'm just laughing at a girl being beaten by a trump yeah I'm you sorry. should really clarify it was that. <laughs> i don't want to say 100 that it was fake but the two the two black people 
Did you do you know what video we're talking about? No. There's a girl who's like sitting down crying. You can't see any of their faces. She has what looks like a bloodied knee, and there and are two ear. black people. Yeah, and a bloody ear. I, I don't know if you see that in the video, but it's in the pictures afterwards. There are two black people. One guy on the right is kind of like kicking at her shoe. And he has what looks like a gun hanging out of his back pocket and a do-rag on his left pocket. And then there's a black guy on the left that does the same thing. And as these guys are speaking, they sound African. Like, uh, like you do, like, it, it, I don't, I'm not gonna, sorry, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, but like, they sound very African, okay? And this video appears out of nowhere as evidence of like pro BLM Democrats beating a girl on her way to a Trump rally. But it just shows up on t on Russian Telegram, then makes its way to Twitter, and it's like, is nobody reporting on this? Like, who's the girl? Like, I did a very simple, because I see in the top left, it shows the Instagram account that posted the video. Like, I go and find the Instagram account. It's got like, it's a random 100 follower account that just posts art. It's not even like related to it. It's a Christian hmm. conspiracy artist person. Sure. Okay, yeah. yeah I'm almost really positive weird. this is a fake video. It uh, looks me too. incredibly I, fake. I, with no, ma no one else reporting on this? Yeah. Especially now that I see it started on Telegram from like a Russian site. I'm just like, okay, I just don't believe this. Or like the Iman, uh, Iman Khalif stuff, the, the box. Her, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. All of that conspiracy that drove about her being a man started with a Russian bought out thing. And so it's like, you know, there's like this issue where it's like, uh, where like conspiracy theory is really, really dangerous and also confusing to me because there are just like legitimate things that seem conspiratorial that are true in mm -hmm. real life that we could just focus on. Um, you know, like Epstein for a long time was considered a conspiracy theory until more and more evidence came out about the sex trafficking trafficking right and so it's like it's really important that people understand like when something starts as a conspiracy theory if there's like any validity like archaeologists will research it like that that hill that people keep thinking is a pyramid or whatever in bosnia yeah it's like archaeologists like they're just like archaeologists don't want to look at it and it's like of course they do they they have they yeah. they do they go and they look at it and then they're like oh yeah it's just a hill or just recently the uh the covid hydrochloricon uh studies that came out of the mediterranean this massive study was just done into all the evidence for hydrochloricon treating covid and it's all data fraud out of this one hospital right and so it's just it's just frustrating because it's like if hydrochloroquine worked to treat COVID, there would like scientists are just motivated to treat it. They would just find the evidence for it and utilize it. And that's why some conspiracies come out and we're like, oh yeah, this person is a sex trafficker. This person did do these crimes. You know, Russia is making like bots as a form of like propaganda war, like info war. Um, and it, it's just, I don't know. I just don't know how to like talk with people being like, when I'm saying conspiracy theory, I don't want to dismiss you outright and entirely because there are some things in real life that are more wild than fiction. But in the real world, these things get investigated. And why it's getting lumped as a conspiracy theory is people have looked into it and there's just not the evidence for it. Yeah. Um, Sorry, yeah, that was so a no, whole No, no, no. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, let's think about that. So, you know, the idea of misinformation versus disinformation. I think a lot of the ways that pseudo-archaeology spreads is just straight up misinformation, right? Like but malicious it, actors? No, no. Misinformation meaning people are mistaken. Ah, okay, they, they don't understand what's going on. That's different from disinformation, okay. where you are purposefully creating something that is false. Like, like, for example, I've been asked a whole lot of times on different podcasts or by interviews with journalists, do I think that Graham Hancock believes in what he says? And to be honest, I've read a lot of Graham Hancock, I've listened to him a lot. I'm not sure. I actually could see him as somebody who believes what he says, right? I think he's absolutely wrong on everything, but he really could believe in what he says. On the other hand, like I just mentioned that example of Gobekli Tepe and that conspiracy theory there, that's straight up disinformation. That is somebody who clearly does not believe this and is saying it to get clicks, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. And so there's a big difference there and there is more and more. It's actually something I think that's somewhat new in archaeology just in the last like decade where there's actually disinformation getting published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, so a good example, and this came up on Joe Rogan, is one of Graham Hancock's allies is this Indonesian geologist who went to this site called Gunung Padang and he had the favor of the president of Indonesia at that time and he went and he did some geological prospection and then he published the data in this archaeological journal. And like the data section of the paper is is okay, but the 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 intro and the conclusion and the title has nothing to do with the data. 
It's like he claims that it's the oldest pyramid in the world that dates back to 26,000 years ago. A, it's not a pyramid. B, nothing dates to 26,000 years ago. And it's just clearly just twisting the evidence to make it look that way. And it got published. It got through peer review. And so this was, you know, Graham had announced our debate. So I had journalists get in touch with me. And I'm like, all right, I'll read the paper. I read it through. And I'm like, this is the, the methods here make no sense. The way you're dating this is you're taking like, you know, the White House, drilling a core meters, meters below the White House, pulling it up, doing radiocarbon date, taking the oldest date and saying the White House dates to that period. And it's like, dude, the core below that is before the White House. You know what I mean? It doesn't date the friggin' White House. And so, you know, I, I, I actually said that. It's in The Guardian, except I use Westminster. And so, because it was the UK. And so, like, it's just straight up the, not how you interpret archaeology. And I cannot understand a trained geologist who could do this without knowing that. Right. So that's what I call disinformation. And in the end, that got retracted. Right. And so leading up to the debate, I got in touch with the actual Indonesian archaeologist that actually excavated the dang site. We had an interview for my YouTube and stuff like that. And it was great. And then Graham, he takes that and he's like, Flint controls the media. He's like, a, you know, a puppet master who has all these journalists. And he's the one that got that paper retracted and everything like that. I'm like, Dude, my YouTube at the time had like 4,000 subscribers. You're saying I control the media? Are you freaking kidding me? The only reason they get in touch with me is because you announced that I'm going to be talking to you, you know? And so you're the one that made me prominent, not me. And so, you know, this is the kind of disinformation that you see. And there's more and more, not, not a lot of it, but there's a little bit of it being published here and there. I know of some other ones that I don't feel like bringing up right now. But uh, it's sort of like this kind of research of people infiltrating our field to take our data and present it in a different way is real weird and we don't really i think know how to deal with that as a field it's something that i'm trying to do more research on and i'm, I'm, I'm going to be publishing on in the future I'm, I'm writing a book on atlantis and the ways that it relates to the modern day and trying to present the actual evidence of why it's not true and to try to touch, uh, draw out this kind of misinformation and disinformation that's occurring in the world around us right mm -hmm. and it's weird how archaeology is totally wrapped up in this we don't think of it this way and it, I don't know if there's any Russian funding of this, but some of the more hardcore conspiracy theorists that do pseudo-archaeology, they certainly are very pro-Russia and stuff like that. So I don't know how to uncover if they're being funded or whatnot, but they're or part of that yeah. conspiracist culture, which obviously is promoted by Russia and stuff like that because of the damage it does to how we understand the truth around us. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm about to... I'm about to Dump a lot of stuff. Okay. Uh -oh. If I say anything that you agree or disagree with or want to input in, just cut me can, off. Can okay? I can I cut you off really quick? Yeah, can go. I actually use the bathroom? Really go quick? for it. Knock us about. All right, great. Cool. <laughs> you want me to start? Yeah, go for it. Okay, finally I got you all on my own. Now I'm kind of, <laughs> time to destroy you. Uh oh. <clears throat> okay. Kyla stepped into the restroom. Okay, I got a lot. I got a lot. Okay. Okay. Um You mentioned disinformation versus misinformation. A lot of the ways that I see these filtered down are the, the, the start will be a disinformation person and then it will be uptaken by misinformation clients, basically. That when I look at a, a, an environment that's rife with incorrect stuff, usually the people at the bottom, I think are genuinely uninformed or misinformed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the people at the top, I usually ascribe a lot more malevolence to. Uh, it'll depend on the particular thing, but there are certain ways, and I know that you know this for your field, there are certain things where there's no possible way that you know this without also knowing why this is bullshit. There's no way that you could possibly know this. Um, when I, uh, I, I've debated a lot relating to January 6th, um, there's a journalist who was lucky that Edward Snowden reached out to him to give a bunch of leaks called Glenn Greenwald. And um, I don't know your opinion of him, but we got into a debate around some stuff relating to January 6th as part of that, um, Donald Trump and his cronies falsified seven different sets of electors to try to win different swing states. Mm -hmm. And Glenn Greenwald had immediately brought up, well, you understand that this happened in 1960 as well in Hawaii. And I was like, absolutely not in the same way. What do you, what I, I, I think I asked him, I was like, what do you, what were the circumstances of that? Now, I was mostly expecting to be like, well, you know, they sent in two slates of electors or whatever, but that's not what he said. He said, well, the election was incredibly close. There was a, you know, within, a, within recount lengths of the state legislature sent in two sets so that they could nominate, you know, which one they wanted to be chosen on the election. I was like, okay, 
So you knew that. Did you just think I didn't know and I wouldn't ask? Because what you understand, that's nothing like what's being presented today, right? There's no way that he had that one fact without knowing. And he actually did know the greater context around it, which blew my mind that he even revealed that he knew. I was like, you're just lying then because you're bringing that up. That's disinformation. You could never know that much without also knowing why what you're saying is, is bullshit. Go ahead. No, oh, I agree with you. Yeah. I think that that's the key. I think it's a uh, so like you know like I mentioned that Graham Hancock. I can't believe like I, I'm not sure whether he believes in what he writes or not. I I could believe that he does, mm -hmm. right? Because he's very consistent. On the other hand, I brought up that point during the debate we had where he smears me, and it's completely done in a way that that is disinformation. He is he went there with an attempt to smear me to make it look like I had said stuff about him that I had not, mm -hmm. to make it look like I was orchestrating some sort of conspiracy against him. And so it's clear that he was doing that part intentionally, if you see what I mean. And yeah. it's almost the case on every stream I'm on where somebody brings up a source that seems to completely contradict what I'm saying. I was like, let's just Google it and read it. Mm -hmm. And basically 100% of the time we just like, okay, well this is not saying at all what you're saying. I see how, what well, you've quoted here, but you understand that like the next sentence literally disagrees with your conclusion, right? Um, well, oh, uh, it was Tim Pool citing something that Jordan Peterson had cited. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the, there's like a human centipede in media where the first person bastardizes some scientific study and then it goes from <laughs> alternative media mouthpiece to alternative media mouthpiece through the centipede. I've never heard the phrase, Good but visual. it makes a lot it, of sense. That's yeah. exactly yeah. what it is, yeah. yeah. But basically, Tim Pool uh, was saying that as women make more money in relationships, they hate their partners and they leave the relationships because they upgrade to, to higher status men. And this is why feminism has failed. And I'm like, wait, well, where did this come from? So I Google around and I find it in, in Jordan Peterson. And Peterson cites a little bit better. He's like, well, there was a study in Sweden that shows that when women upgrade their jobs, they have a higher proclivity to abandon the lower status male in the relationship and, and find you know, somebody who out earns them now that they're in a higher earning category. And so it's like, okay, well, what the fuck is he citing? So I, I Google. Also, research is really easy to find online. And if you're mm -hmm. willing to read one or two papers, they're not that hard to understand, generally. At the very least, like the unless you're reading like the neuropharmacological mechanism mechanisms of some crazy f***ing you know, uptake inhibitor drug or whatever. like as long as it's just like a, a paper generally they're pretty easy especially for a lot of sociology stuff um not to say that you're going to understand every single thing through the entire paper but like you at least get uh, an understanding you can of read it the yeah yeah and so um and i find the original research that they're citing and it was a paper in sweden that looked at the marital habits of women that won political elections so we're already in an incredibly unique cohort, okay? Mm -hmm. We're already in an incredibly unique cohort. But the really interesting thing about the paper, here's another thing, okay? Now, I know all of us as humans are really smart, but believe it or not, when you ask the most basic f question ever about a study, the researcher has probably thought of it. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times, you know, somebody will cite, you know, a, a study published in like The Lancet and, you know, it'll be like, uh, you know, like they've shown that getting more sleep or, or, or doing something, you know, helps. And somebody will be like, I wonder if they realize that poor people get less sleep than rich people. And it's like, you know, at some point, <laughs> in publishing in one of the most prestigious journals in the world and working for a university where they're, somebody probably did ask that question, believe it or not. And you know what? More often than not, if you read the study, they might even have an answer there. Yeah. And sometimes, and this is, I hate this, sometimes the more fascinating stuff will be in the methodology of the study. Um, fuck, I'm, uh, uh, tangent I don't know tangent. if I've ever heard that take. So, the methodology is the most interesting Super part. interesting study it's on, important. I think it was it published in Nature, uh, 100 million traffic stops by police officers to analyze if there was bias in pulling over black people or white people based on the time of day. And the mm -hmm. hypothesis was, is as we get closer to nighttime, um, we expect to see the racial disparities drop a bit because people are pulling over people based on whether or not they can identify if they're black or not, right? And I brought this up in a debate, um, and there's a guy, AJW, uh, Sean something, uh, this was many years ago, but obviously he immediately says, he's like, okay, well, obviously there's a huge issue here and that black people just might work different types of jobs at night versus white people. And I'm like, that could be the case. Well, what do they say in the paper? Thankfully, I'd read the paper and they had this really ingenious test to look for it. And they measured before and after daylight savings time to see if the things would change dramatically. And they did change dramatically because huh. of the daylight changing, but not the work schedules because it's daylight savings time. Of course. Yeah, so that was an example. I was like, oh, that method, that's really smart how they would track for something like that. Um, and there, yeah, there will be times. So, and going back, back, back one time to the Swedish paper, it was interesting because the authors of the paper, as they noticed that as women won elections, they were more likely to uh, divorce versus women that lost their elections. And in the next uh, paragraph as they were going through, uh, they were like, um, one thing that we hypothesize is it might be the case that, um, or one thing that we wonder is it might be the case that women are upgrading mates. 
And so we also tracked um, the, the number of males in the work environments before and after, and we tracked the dispositions of the people in the relationships. And what we found was when women were going to uh, environments with more or less males than the environments that they'd left, there was absolutely no correlation whatsoever to the women changing partners. But with the one thing that we did find that was the most correlated with whether the woman would leave her husband or not were both partners' views on traditional roles in relationships. And the more that you skewed towards having a feminist view of a relationship, the chances of the woman leaving were basically a wash. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't different at all to the ones that lost their election. So that's an example where when you read the study, it's like, okay, well, the authors checked for the exact mechanism that you're saying is causing this effect, and they literally check for this, and it's not happening. And the actual cause is the exact opposite of what you're citing the paper for. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I completely agree. Yes. I'm not sure how you destroyed me. But no, I, no, 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 yeah. But it's an idea of like, and, and so, <clears throat> Backing up more, um, one frustrating thing when dealing with people, and I, I don't know if you've gotten this, somebody will say something and you realize like, uh, there's a phrase that I've fallen in love with a long time ago, I don't use it much anymore, you're not even wrong, okay? You're not even, you haven't even gotten to a point where you can say something that's not correct because you're so on an island, you're so lost. Mm -hmm. And sometimes somebody will say something, it's like, I, I, like, it's gonna take me like 15 minutes just to explain how nonsense the statement that you just made was. And we're gonna have to go back into a lot. and. Um, some of these concepts I, I wish people would talk about more. Um, one of these things are uh, fundamental assumptions about humans. Mm -hmm. Human beings are fundamentally social creatures that are generally pretty good. Like to take somebody to do evil, horrible things to a lot of people, that's an exceptional person, or they need an exceptional set of circumstances. Like being maybe in like a, in a military conflict or somebody's like dictating to them some evilness or whatever, and there's like no accountability mechanisms or whatever. So um, earlier you guys were kind of talking about like, well, there's sometimes they're real conspiracies and sometimes they're bullshit conspiracies. If you were to tell me right now that the CIA or the FBI, that in the leadership, um, you know, like a, a group of like five or six different people were discussing, like maybe we can do false flag attacks on Americans in order to do a particular thing uh, to, to effect some political outcome, you know, to get a war in Iraq or whatever. Uh, if you were to tell me that this conversation happened between like five or six people, high up in leadership, I, that's that sounds like on its face, a priori, my assumption for this is maybe 20 or 30%. It's like, okay, Lehigh, like I, I could, I, yeah, that, there's nothing immediately here that sounds impossible. But if you were to tell me that that exact same plan was implemented and carried out by a thousand different federal agents, my a priori has dropped to 1% or less. Because to incorporate that many people on something so evil, like that isn't, that's, that's a lot. Most yeah. people working for government are just like ordinary dudes. That's a crazy. In fact, those are historical events like World War II where yeah. you can, yeah. Yeah, um, they're exceptional. And, exceptional. And I, I think that, uh, I think you're exactly right. And it's a question of sitting down and reading the methods and understanding again what the field is. So I've run across this, for example, um, and I also want to touch on something Kyla said earlier, which I think this relates to, which is unfalsifiability. Right? It's sort of like, how do you look at this kind of stuff and whether it's falsifiable or not? And so one of the things that I've come across is within archaeology, there's this whole study of how do things preserve for us or not? Why do we find some things and why do we not find others, right? And this is a huge thing. This is like the background towards everything we do. This sort of study, it's called formation processes. It's how did the archeological record form? How does it survive for us? And so, you know, people often say, well, all right, you can't say that because you can't be sure about what is there and what is not or what preserves and what's not. It's like, dude, we have a whole study about understanding how things preserve in the archeological record. That's like what we do, that's our job. And so, you know, I was recently critiqued because, you know, again, I'll go back to this Graham Hancock conversation where he always criticizes archeologists because he's looking for a civilization that was from the ice age. So he says, it must have been on the coastline. And with, at the end of the ice age, all that ice melts, the sea level rises, it's underwater. That's why nobody finds it, right? It's this global civilization on the coast. And so I'm like, all right, can we test that? It sounds unfalsifiable, and many people think it is, but actually we can friggin' test that. We can look for- Go snorkeling. Yeah, we, we, can, we, well, exactly. we, can, we can actually look underwater. We have a lot of underwater archeology. span And in fact, before I went on, I had an interview with Jessica Cocale at the University of Bradford. She's an underwater archeologist who focuses on stone age stuff from the ice age and right afterwards underwater, right? And I understood how do things survive? How do things not survive? What do we find, right? At the same time, I also started doing research. What about areas where 
it was coastline in the ice age and it's not underwater now. There's lots of reasons why that might be the case, like tectonic uplift on the south coast of Crete, a site I've been to, it dates after the ice age, a little after. The reason it's not underwater is because the African tectonic plate is going under the European one and pushing up the south coast of Crete. Or in northwest Canada, right? There's something called where the glacier's melting and the glacier has all this weight. It's putting down the, pushing down the land. As it melts, the sea level's rising, but there's less weight on the land, so it rebounds. It's called isostatic rebound. So we have all these coastal sites and it's like, look, we can actually test this. We can actually look and see if this is true or not. Similarly, you're saying this is a global civilization. Where are your ships, right? We find wooden ships underwater. The reason why, you guys remember earlier, I mentioned where does organic remains preserve? Waterlogged, Waterlogged environments. That's why we find ships going back like six, 7,000 years. Uh -huh. And so where are your ships, man? You know, <laughs> like where are your ships? And so I would just to sort of think this through, this is why you need to understand methods of a field to be able to answer, have we thought this stuff through or not, right? Second of all, it's actually a lot of things that people think are not falsifiable, meaning like the general public, from a scientific perspective, they are falsifiable, right? And this is something that I've come across with this attack on me, where people are like, archeologists can't be confident about it being a lost civilization because it would be lost, so they wouldn't know where it is, so it's not <laughs> disprovable. And this was Graham's big argument. What's the percentage of the Sahara that you've actually studied? I'm like, dude, my dad did a large scale survey in the Sahara and found thousands of fucking uh, Ice Age sites there. That's what he did, right? You know, we find this stuff because we target it and look for it. And so, there's this idea in the general public that certain things are not falsifiable when in fact they actually are by the experts who understand how the field works, if that makes sense. The same thing comes up a lot um, in, in two different ways. One is the, uh, um, I deal with this so much when I'm talking about, I, you mentioned it before the stream that I'm doing a lot of January 6th stuff. One of the most common questions people tell me is like, you can't tell what somebody's state of mind is. And I'm like, you understand that the entire criminal justice system in the United States is based around mens rea. You have to have a criminal state of mind to be convicted of a crime. So when you tell me, also number one, so so not only is that for, for the field of law, for, for the justice system, that's complete bullshit. But number two, you don't believe that. You, like you absolutely ascertain people's states of mind all the time, yeah. right? Because if I were to ask you questions about a political opponent, well, now you're going to have very strong feelings, but with far less uh, intent, way more uh, inferencing that you're doing to figure out the state of mind. Um, that's a really dumb thing. Something that you hit on, there are very few things that like carry over from field to field in terms of like healthy epistemic practice, where it's like, if you can just keep this thing in mind, it'll help you in a lot of ways. Because oftentimes I, I find you just, you kind of need the vocabulary in the field. Mm -hmm. But one thing I think from stats that it carries over from field to field generally is um, there's a concept called effect size. And if somebody is proffering, if somebody's giving you a massive effect size thing that the entire field has missed, your prior assumption for this being true needs to be almost nothing. So for instance, if somebody were to tell me, um, we just got a new study that came out of India that shows that ivermectin reduces the time sick from COVID from 14 days on average to like 13 and a half days or 13 days on average, okay, maybe. That like immediately, like maybe. But if somebody tells you, as so many people were, ivermectin works as a 100% prophylactic against uh, COVID-19, right? Okay, if there are so many people studying this thing and now you're giving me an effect size with such a huge magnitude, how did everybody miss this? Mm -hmm. Impossible. If somebody were on, for archeology, span like uh, just guessing, right? Like if somebody were to say that, uh, you know, like up up near the uh, the North Pole, there, w there was discovered like uh, what looked like a crash site from the Vikings that had previously like never been heard of before. Like, okay, well, it's it's a very small effect and maybe it's reasonable why people wouldn't have researched Like my, my prior assumption without knowing anybody, like, okay, maybe that sounds like it could be true. But if somebody were to say, you know, like along the entire West Coast, there was this expansive civilization that existed for, you know, a hundred years before they finally, you know, fell. And it's like, how many ships, oil rigs, archeologist people, how could something so grand have been missed by so many people? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and it's why some of these pseudoscientific theories are falsifiable. Because it's not like they're claiming, oh, maybe there's some minor traces of metallurgy in the Ice Age, or some people that were starting to move towards agriculture. Mm -hmm. No, they're saying there's a global civilization with advanced technology. Mm -hmm. And it's like, are you 
fucking kidding me, man? And so, you know, there's another thing that I've been engaging in. It's not, a, it's not pseudoscience. It's, 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 a, it's an example of bad communication of archaeology. So I don't know if you guys saw oh. on Netflix, there's a, there was a show, what, a year ago called Cave of Bones. And it was about this new hominid species, Homo naledi, which apparently had fire, buried its dead, uh, the, had art, and the earliest examples of all these things, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was a big backlash because this entire Netflix series was based on a non-peer-reviewed paper, a preprint. And uh, I was one of the first people, but there were a lot of other people, I don't want to say I'm the only one in any way, to critique publicly these preprints and the entire things behind it. And so, you know, because it became such a huge furor in the field, and it was sort of happening at the same time some of this Graham Hancock discussion was happening, people started comparing Dr. Lee Berger to Graham Hancock, saying, you know, they're the same thing, this is just as bad, and it's just sort of like, in fact, I was just uh, zooming in to University of Colorado, talking about this public engagement and stuff like that with one of the peer reviewers on that Home and a Lady paper for her class. And uh, she came forward publicly to say, hey, this is a real problem, the way this was presented to the public, right? Because all the peer reviews for this paper were negative. And they specifically chose not to publish, it was for a journal that uh, publishes peer reviews, and they chose not to publish the peer reviews for a while. So it got disseminated through New York Times, National Geographic, everywhere. Home and a lady buries their dead, they use art and all this kind of stuff, and every peer review unanimously is like, this is not proven. And so it's turned into a Netflix show, and so people are like, you know, Lee Berger's like Graham Hancock. And it's like, no, he's not. Like, not at all. The, the, the idea of an advanced lost civilization from the Ice Age, that is, you know, you could disprove that. You can say, everyone can unanimously say that is not true. Mm -hmm. When it comes to home and the lady burying their dead, everybody can unanimously, well, most people can say that's not proven yet, but it's a hypothesis worthy of testing. Right? It certainly is. And so it's an example of the of, of, of bad dissemination of your results because you're over optimistic versus, you know, pseudo archaeology, if you see what I mean. It's also an example of like uh it's hard nobody nobody believes this when I argue this. It's very hard to get something aboard with this, but oftentimes some information can be worse than no information. Mm -hmm. Um that if 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 you don't know anything about a particular thing, you might just be you have no idea. But if I give you just a couple pieces, you might be drawing conclusions that are way worse than you just having no understanding whatsoever of that particular thing itself. Um, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, the, I, there was a, is it called Medivax or something? There was a there's a website that started doing preprints during COVID that blew up a lot. And I think preprints are a good example of the capability. It's cool to be able to get information out there and to have people looking at stuff that is like before it's even been peer reviewed. That idea of like cutting edge research being available is cool. But my God, the like nobody understands like okay, well it's a dog, it's a preprint. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it actually ties in really close. I was wanting to ask you about this because um, we were talking a lot about academics disseminating information and being really cautious about what that looks like. Because um, there's such a massive push right now for like open science, which mm -hmm. broadly I'm for, uh, but I was talking to somebody who's very opposed to open science and he brought up a really, really good point, which is essentially what you're bringing up, which is that if you give data to people who are a, disinformation oriented, but even just more likely, just somewhat misinformed, you create this situation where the line between, for example, really good research, good methodology, good statistical analysis, and bad, most people don't know what it is. Heck, most research, there's like, if you go to psychology, most clinical workers don't really know that much between like good methodology. That's why psychology is rife with really bad methodology that's technically peer reviewed. Of course. Um, and so I'm curious if you know much about like psychology's proliferation into, into kind of modern media or anything, but my supervisors are actually, he was part of the head of, um, at least in Alberta, looking into uh, an anti-stigma policy, so trying to educate the public about mental health. But the problem with something like mental health is it's um, it's a deeply difficult topic to investigate, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is essentially understanding how the brain works, which we don't even at like a neurocognitive level really understand how it works super well. But then from that emergent kind of behavioral patterns and pathologies that come from the structure that we barely understand right. And so what it's led to is this kind of proliferation of pop psychology, misinformation, bad information, old information that doesn't get updated, but also you now have full blown academics and researchers. There's a whole branch within psychology now that's like rejecting all 
traditional modern statistical methods of psychology analysis because they have kind of grown up on pop psychology, mm -hmm. um, right? And so it creates this really interesting thing of essentially like, how do you effectively communicate good information um, so that it doesn't do it, so that half truths don't become more harmful. Um, but also if you don't communicate at all, then you're just creating a space where the disinformers can flourish, um, which is a really tricky battle for uh, the institution to manage. You guys ask good questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, it's, it's, it's not easy. One of the things that I'm trying to grapple with as well is this uh, move towards open science. I am fully for it. But, you know, me also engaging now in the public sphere, you see all the negatives of it as well. Yeah. And it's like, man, this is weird. It's such a weird ethical conundrum about how to actually engage and deal with it. And I think we all need to struggle. We live in this world where everything is so different than it was even a few decades ago, ago, partly due to the internet. And, you know, I'm, I'm almost realizing the mistake of the internet. I mean, I'm not saying that it is a mistake, but there's a lot of mistakes there with everybody having access to information. Like you said, they, they read it in an unnuanced way or there's actual bad actors who want to twist it. And how do we deal with that, I'm not sure. Um, but I do think that one of the biggest mistakes that my colleagues sometimes make, not all of them, but some of them make when they talk with the public, is they, 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 they make things simple. Right? And, and they, they think that if they make things simple, they're understandable, and then therefore things get across. But when you make things simple, you make mistakes. You know, you're, you're making things less complex than the reality, which is very complex. And so I always tell my colleagues, if you're going to start uh, talking with the public, which everybody, a lot of them want to do, and uh, I've, I've given this speech a few times, is don't make things simple, make them understandable. And that's the key. We should be teaching the nuance and the complexity to the public. You know, like my entire point about that homo and a lady thing was, this is a great hypothesis. The, the context that you have with these, all these different skeletal remains of homo and a lady, a hypothesis about them burying their dead is a valid hypothesis. But when you present it in this sure way, it's definitely burial. When you haven't even fully excavated one of the burial that you're presenting, it's only partially excavated, only partially studied, et cetera, that is making things too simple for people. Uh -huh. And so we need to, we, we, we have to communicate in an understandable, but still a complex and nuanced way. We have to, another way that I put it is we should never be infantilizing the public. You know, these are adults that we are talking to. And if we make things too simple, then that turns them off and things like that. We should be being very, you know, treat them like adults. And I think that's one of the reasons I did well on Joe Rogan because I really brought a lot of evidence and I made it very complicated and I showed how complicated it was and the kind of evidence we had and people responded to that because it was like a, an engaging university lecture and that's how people even put it. And so, you know, it's just like we have to not infantilize, we have to not make things simple, but we need to make them understandable. Yeah, and then you, I think one of the also big challenges is you're coming into fields where generally speaking, I would hope maybe, generally speaking, when you're teaching students, the student is there to learn or at the very least to pass the test. But oftentimes, I imagine for most subjects, they're not coming in to debate you out of your field of expertise. That if you're teaching, you know, quantum field theory in a physics class, some guy's not here to argue why wave functions are ridiculous and not real. Like you don't have to deal with a person who's gonna sit here and like try to debate you and all that. Like, what the fuck do you, we're just gonna go over this, okay? Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the things that I, I kind of spoke about this before, having like this just general working vocabulary and knowledge of a field that helps is um, sometimes there are, there are things that if, if people just had some of the background, even without the good epistemic practices, if people just had some of the backgrounds of a lot of the concepts involved, or if they knew sometimes what they were saying mm -hmm. when they were saying things, I think that people it's just hard to make people aware of that. One of the things that I often stress with people, um, especially when you're looking at charts or graphs, um, you don't have a, nobody here has a background in music, so I won't use any music analogies, but it's good sometimes to to when you're when you're looking at a thing, like take a step back and just talk about like, well, what the fuck are you actually, what are you looking at? Like, what, yeah. do, you, what do you like talk about this, right? Um, and sometimes like, if you can just step back and think about what you're looking at, you can immediately say like, oh shit, this doesn't really make much sense, right? Like a graph between married men make this much and single men make this much. And it's very easy to say, okay, well, single men get married, then they're gonna make a lot of money. It's like, okay, take a step back. What are, we, what are you looking at? Okay, well, I see that single men who become, no, 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 no. Married men make this much, single men make this much. We know this is true, right? Talk about this, okay? Well, I don't. I mean, well, it seems like if you're married, you make more. Okay. Do you think that maybe when you make more money, you maybe tend to get married, 
okay, yeah, I guess, right? Because there's no relationship between these two graphs beyond that. And there's so much information that when you look at it and you take a step back and like, okay, well, what am I actually looking at? Maybe the maybe maybe having a better macro level understanding. But if you don't understand anything in the field or you don't have any conceptual basis at all, it's very hard to immediately understand why something is the way that it is. Uh, on another example on this, when I was arguing uh, recently having to do with um, whether or not Donald Trump was breaking norms or doing egregious actions in the White House, somebody very quickly brought up, what about when Obama did a drone strike against a guy? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, these two things are, are, are different. You can tell in the way that they approached getting advice for how they were doing the thing. And somebody was like, well, I don't see the difference. Donald Trump talked to his lawyers and Obama talked to his lawyers. And I was like, Donald Trump spoke to his personal lawyers, Obama spoke to the OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel in the White House. These are worlds apart, immediately understandable, if you know the difference. But for a lot of people, well, what is the difference between a personal lawyer and a White House lawyer? Like they're both at the end yeah. of the day, right? That's conceptually, it's kind of hard. And for some topics, and I'm sure this is true of every field, I'm sure this is true of our, there are things where the question itself is deceptively hard, but if you have the conceptual background, the question is actually incredibly obvious. Like it's so obvious that if you understand like this or that, then you would immediately know why this is the way it is or why this is good or bad or whatever. But without doing any homework or without having any conceptual understanding, it's very hard to sort through because now it's just whoever can weave the better story, basically, it feels like. And I think that that step back advice is actually the best advice I give to any uh, academics that actually want to engage with pseudoscientists, right? So often we don't step back. In fact, in many of the attempts to engage with Graham Hancock, so Graham Hancock is, he, he he's it's hilarious, actually, how his ideas are perceived in archaeology. Because what he does is he goes to things like pyramids, or the Sphinx, or things like that, monuments that date from only a few thousand years ago, and then he sort of says that they are fingerprints of this civilization from 10,000, 12,000, 13,000 years ago. And so what that leads to is is because he's at the pyramid or the Sphinx or he's at that pyramid or he's at that monument, you get area experts, somebody who focuses on Mesoamerica and the Mayans and says, well, that's not true about the Mayans. And then somebody who, who specializes in Egypt says, well, that's not true about the Egyptians. <laughs> and then what's, what's lost is all the people that study the Ice Age. They don't even realize he's talking about the Ice Age because he doesn't even go to any of the evidence from the Ice Age. He he says that evidence doesn't matter because it's a lost civilization. And so then you end up with this situation where nobody steps back because in the end, what he's actually talking about is the Ice Age. But since he doesn't actually talk about any evidence from the Ice Age, there's nothing to debunk by Ice Age archaeologists, if you see what I mean. And so w nobody actually takes that step back. And that's why I actually think I stepped up because of my own weird experience where my dad was an Ice Age archaeologist and I grew up on Ice Age sites and I'm familiar with Ice Age archaeology. But my expertise is in historical archaeology in ancient Greece. And therefore, I've read things like Plato's Atlantis in ancient Greek. And I can address the historiography of how Atlantis becomes this lost Ice Age civilization. And so th that was what I think one of the big differences was taking that step back and actually saying, this is our evidence in the Ice Age, guys. And it was funny, I'm talking to all my dad's like former colleagues and friends who I know very well, and I'm explaining to them I'm doing this. And like, why are you even doing this? I'm like, dude, he's presenting Ice Age stuff. They're like, I thought he was about pyramids. And I'm like, yeah, but in the Ice Age, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's that taking that step back that I think is really, really important to try to, and that's where I think, again, engaging is about pedagogy, rather, I mean, sorry, how you teach, rather than what your research is. Because our own research is all super focused. And if we're gonna apply our research to engaging with pseudoscientists, we're gonna fail. We need to instead apply the way that we teach students, which Rhetoric. is the larger picture, right? Mm -hmm. That step back, yeah. There's uh, one of the funny things, and obviously this is a whole, you have to be ready to go down a lot of different branches. Uh, if you open this, this uh, bag up, but I, when people are engaged in very wide conspiracies involving all of society, sometimes it's fun also to just step back and like imagine, like this is when I'll run through, like somebody will say, you know, like I think that the elites are doing this to try to destroy society in X, Y, Z way. And it's like, okay, let's assume for one moment, if you were an elite, okay, why the fuck would you want to destroy your own goddamn country? Wouldn't we be trying to destroy the other countries? Like, let's say, for instance, and, and I know I'm touching a lot of topics, but there's a lot of conventional wisdom like that I believe yes. yeah, is not necessarily correct. And uh, no, I don't know what your political saying, but like, so people will oftentimes point to like, oh, like countries start wars just to make money. And that's because the elites are profiting. I was like, okay, well, let's say that I'm an elite, okay? I have uh, some, so I've got some military contractors in my country that are, you know, their collective net worth is half of that of Apple. 
wouldn't I just want to like try to steal like 5% of Apple and try to ensure as much world stability as possible? Wouldn't I make more money doing that? Why would I want to destroy and fucking ruin everything? Like it doesn't even serve my purpose. Like who's actually benefiting? It's like, well, the people that are benefiting are these people. Like, okay, well, these people are benefiting from these companies that are collectively worth like $300 billion. If the world was this evil, why wouldn't these guys that own these companies are worth, tr why wouldn't they just like put a hit out and kill those guys? Like, why would you want to start war over here when these guys who are selling product at fucking China are now their stock is losing, right? Like a few points in Apple stock is the entirety of like fucking, you know, Raytheon. <laughs> like, why, like, wouldn't these guys just hire hits to kill these guys? Like, if you were running a conspiracy theory, wouldn't you want to do that? Like, if, if uh, yeah, just like kind of stepping back and like talking through things. Although, depending on the person, they can they can have a, a reason for everything. But it, yeah, it's just funny to imagine like why why would this even be happening? Uh, why would the entire world be? Or, or or even like when it comes to vaccine stuff. If our vaccine was so bad. Why wouldn't Russia or China be saying something about that? Wouldn't they be screaming that from the rooftops that Americans are poisoning their own citizens? Or not that it always happens, but oftentimes Jews, well, I guess if you've been attacked for this, you'd know this, right? Jews and conspiracy theories run hand in hand. Okay, oh, so the yeah. COVID vax was like so horrible um, and was there to poison all of us. Why is it the Jewish people in Israel were like the largest uptakers initially? They were the first ones to take that. Why? Did they get like a super Jewish vax or was it a different <laughs> thing? Or like, because they had the mRNA ones, right? And it's like none of it really at the end of the day like holds up to any real level of scrutiny. And also, I find this this has never worked for me so i don't know why i'm saying people should do this but i i just i asked the question i wish people would consider this is there another explanation that also like very neatly and easily like what if these people just thought that this was the best way to do this thing and they tried it and it wasn't and they made a mistake people make mistakes right oh, one yeah. thing that's very difficult in conspiracy theories and this is always i haven't found a way to to make this a winning rhetorical argument is sometimes every single thing you're saying all of your effects at the end, they're actually right, but you're just not for the right reason. And a really good example is I think sometimes um, could be issues relating to science even or peer review, where it might be the fact that there's a lot of research that's coming out around this particular topic that's that's not good. I don't think it's because these guys are intentionally trying to hoodwink and brainwash the entire world. It's probably because maybe the culture in this particular place is veered a little bit off too much into one direction and the self-corrective mechanisms need to be adjusted. And even though you might have a similar output and then somebody's like, well, look, they just found that. And it's like, yeah, but my explanation still fits 100%. <laughs> and it's far less insane than your explanation that you have no evidence for, right? Um, you can even have like similar end results, but it's like, well, let's look at what, maybe these guys thought they were doing the right thing. I think lockdowns, I think we can probably in retrospect say, especially around schools, some of the lockdowns probably were too aggressive, but I don't think it's because the elites were trying to destroy their own countries, which doesn't make sense. People probably were scared because it was a new virus and nobody knew what the fuck was gonna happen, right? They didn't wanna be yeah. the politician in charge of like thousands of kids dying. Yeah, they all and you're COVID also in retrospective versus prospective. Yeah, do you wanna be the guy who said no lockdowns and now half your population dies because it was like a 20% lethality virus? Like, fuck. <laughs> I mean, I think that that's what people forget about COVID was it was new. And like the scientific community constantly framed it in that way. We don't know, but with the limited evidence we have, we think X, Y, Z, and so that's what the best policy, therefore. And so it's like, but they were wrong. Yeah, because they first said, we don't know. Yes. And you know, I think that that's really, really important. And I think also something you touched on that I think is key is you can be right, but for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And so one of the major attacks on archeology span by pseudo-archeologists is that there's this idea that the linear progression of history is, is flawed. Right? And, 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 and it is, I fully agree. There is no evidence anymore for a linear progression of history. You know, like even, even Barack Obama, I remember in his very last speech when he left office, he's talking about like the arc of history. It's gonna turn in this way. And I'm sorry guys, as somebody who studies history and prehistory, what that is is what people do. There is no predetermined outcome in what is happening right now. We cannot predict the future because it depends on what we do tomorrow, right? And so, you know, this idea of a linear history, that's something that historians believed in, you know, 100, 150 years ago, like early 20th century, late 19th century. But for like the last 50, 60 years, we have been slowly dismantling this entire idea of there being some linear progression to human history. There's no inevitable conclusion to where we are going. And so, you know, Graham Hancock says, this is why my advanced civilization exists, because this idea of a linear progression of history is flawed. And it's like, I agree with you that the linear progression of history is flawed, but it doesn't prove your advanced civilization in any way. And so, you know, we need to be very careful about these kind of things and that goes back to like pop understanding of this stuff you know yeah. there's this pop understanding that we're progressing in this way fuck that we're not yeah we're going in whatever direction we go it's very interesting to hear people talk about institutions and science and whatnot i feel like covid was such a good example of 
how the public really doesn't understand how like the institution of science works and develops, right? Mm -hmm. Where they'd be like, well, Fauci was wrong like three times. And you're like, yeah, that's why typically when like major national figures talk about like medicine, they wait until 10 years of FDA testing has gone through to make sure that we know that we know that we know what we're saying. And we didn't have time for that. We yeah. were doing all the same testing, but we didn't have 10 years to go through and like do all this crazy stuff. The process of science is making errors constantly to get you closer and closer to what seems to be the most predictive and like the the little case, the, the lowercase t true, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's very interesting how people have this view of institutions as being like almost like super powered where they're like, they're perfect, they make no flaws, uh, they never make errors, uh, and therefore when they do, it's malicious, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's this lack of understanding of like the human failings um, within these institutions. And to be honest, the institutions perpetuate this a little bit too, right? Uh, thinking about how um, even like the most classic case of the guys who studied the ulcers in the stomach, there's this great resistance to updated science because it challenges like fundamental axioms of the field. Um, same with uh, neuroplasticity. People were super resistant to it because they're like, the brain can't change past 25. The brain can't change and it's like well it can it can it just changes in a way that we weren't expecting you know epigenetics is the same um and so it's like you have to remember science is the self-correcting air-filled system that is also full of people yes. um that are politicking and they don't like new ideas and if you believe in uh you know rigid dna and traditional genetics and epigenetic starts that means your last like 40 years of work could potentially just be garbage all of a sudden which a good scientist should just accept and move on but it's also a person letting go four decades of work I'm pretty sure einstein died hating quantum mechanics i don't think yep. he ever bought in fully to the concept of probabilities and all of that too yeah even though there's a Nobel peace prize that came out i think this year right where local reality isn't real like poor einstein's rolling in his grave because he's just like ah I was wrong. <laughs> but look, we're, we're all human, as you said. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, when we, we, we have these public discourse about science and scientists, it our humanity sometimes does get lost, you know? And it's just sort of like we become these, these figures. And, dude, we're all just people. We make mistakes. We live, laugh, and love like everybody else. And that's, that's what we are. And, you know, at the same time, our institutions are extremely flawed historically. I mean, geez, you look at archaeology as a discipline. It got started by grave robbing. That is literally what it did. It robbed indigenous remains, put them in museums, and studied them, and made all this flawed race science about it. Right? I mean, psychology, yeah, started with what, like phrenology and Sigmund Freud, uh, you know, <laughs> shoving ice picks up people's eyes to change their brains. And <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, were still used. I'm just kidding. I mean, you know, the history of the discipline is totally flawed, and we're still trying to grapple with that. You know, and 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 and, and sometimes some of these institutions are the slowest to change. There was a big a series in ProPublica, what, last year, about, or maybe even this year as well, or last year and this year, about, you know, museums that are not complying with NAGPRA, the North American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, where you need to return indigenous remains to their tribe of origin, and they get to choose what to do with their ancestors, as they should, ethically, right? And so, you know, this is a big problem, and it's a big issue still in archaeology today that's happening very slowly. Or the antiquities trade. There are still lots of looting going on. There's lots of forgeries going on. And that ends up in museums, it ends up in private collectors' hands, and they're just robbing Egypt and other places of their cultural heritage and oftentimes it's like terrorist organizations like ISIS was behind a whole lot of industrial looting. We can tell from satellite imagery and aerial photos of looters trenches appearing all over areas and archaeological sites when ISIS took control of that region, right? Or drug cartels in, in, in South America. Same thing. They like I remember Brian Rose at the University of Pennsylvania he give lectures on this and he talk about how he, had, he would work with the US military and customs and stuff like that and he'd be training them how to identify antiquities because Oftentimes, the, they would smuggle drugs and antiquities together into the country. And you know what was more valuable? The antiquities. And so we need to train people about why these things matter and how they impact local cultures. And then this all comes into pseudo-archaeology as well, because pseudo-archaeology, all these ideas of like a lost civilization from before the flood, that comes from 19th century, 18th century ideas, right? But it hasn't been updated yet. These ethics behind it, what it is is, 
your ancestors were not responsible for those pyramids. It was a lost civilization of white people, or it was aliens, or it was something like that. And so there's all this sort of implicit bias and problems with it. And at the same time, you have these YouTubers that are interested in finding this lost technology, this advanced technology. And what are they doing? They're going to the black market or the unregulated gray market in antiquities, and they're purchasing stuff. And then they're analyzing it themselves and claiming it's advanced technology. And it's like, you don't even know if that's a forgery. You don't know where that comes from. It's looted or it's a forgery or something. And you need to understand the ethics that are involved in what we do. Right, and so this the, the history that baggage is something we all need to be grappling with, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Do you have any well, last questions? Um, <laughs> uh, there are so many questions I could have that we that would be work because I want to go towards wrapping just because we've been chatting chatting for a while, and we mm -hmm. also are going to be talking tomorrow. So tomorrow, we're going to be paying a couple of things, um, like the Atlantis. I feel like. Uh, Milo will have lots of thoughts on, which is kind of why I want to put a star in it. Yeah, I guess here's a here's a here's kind of a broad question. This is my last thing. Um, you mentioned this earlier, and okay. it is true. I would say, unfortunately, but that's because I don't care about ancestry or any of that because whatever. But I understand some people are a lot more wrapped up in it. That the discoveries of archaeologists, um, anthropologi uh, anthropologists, uh, people that study any type of um, ancient, modern, whatever history, that there is a lot of current modern political narrative wrapped up in these disciplines. Um, two things that I can think of that are pretty present are, um, one is obviously the existence of an ancient Jewish temple under Al-Aqsa Mosque, and whether or not that exists or not is fundamental to both people here, where on one side, I think starting with Arafat, there is no temple underneath there. I don't think Mahmoud Abbas, the current leader of the PA, I don't think he thinks there's any temple under there, and the Jews obviously think there is, and the matter of the fact isn't even allowed to be investigated because finding out the reality it might be really bad. That's one thing, and the second thing is, and I'm sure you follow this, I'm just even as a, as a hobby of interest, there has been so much debate, I think a couple years ago because of um, Will Smith's wife over the Egypt stuff, mm. over how black were Egyptians. And I don't know if it's the Nation of Islam or other black nationalist groups. Some people want to claim Egypt a lot in terms of they were all traditionally very black African-American type people. And other people will say Mesopotamian, you know, there were white people, Middle Eastern people, black, all sorts of people. Um, with these two ideas in mind, what is your personal opinion about, or what do you think the field's responsibility should be when it comes to balancing out people's normative ethical concerns over things versus like the historical fact of the matter or the reality and how these things are contextually presented. Yeah, that was a big one, God. <laughs> yeah, it is a big one. Um, look, we all operate in today's world. Mm -hmm. That is the reality of it. If we want to, A, explain why our field is relevant, we need to address modern political concerns. At the same time, modern political concerns are going to inform you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, that kind of stuff, how we approach the past. And the reality of the past, as I hope I've explained throughout this, is it's really frigging complex. Just like I said, the Mediterranean, the Roman Empire, had a mix mixture of people of different ethnicities, what we would call today different races, so did Egypt. You know, there's, there's going to be people that we would call black there today. There's going to be people we would call white there today. And so that's just, that's, that's the reality of Egypt as a sort of location and where it is located, right? You're going to have people from different backgrounds, ancestry backgrounds. And so I think that, uh, uh, so some of this relates to what we study. Right? So, you know, what do we study? Well, we study that complexity, and that's the truth of it, is that there's people of different ethnic backgrounds in Egypt, let's say. I don't really have a good answer for you for the temple under, mm -hmm. uh, in, in it's Israel. It's not, not so much like what is the truth of the matter, but just that um, how, do you, how do you think the field should approach um, so like, so, so like, oh, here's, wait, wait, here's I, was get, I was gonna get to that. Oh, oh yeah, 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 so, yeah, so I, I got you. So I think some of it is also how pop culture takes up this stuff, right? So what we've seen is when you look at say, old movies with Cleopatra, uh -huh. she's portrayed by a white person, usually a British descent because everybody has to have a British accent on sort of movies that are set in the past, yeah. right? Because yeah. that to us is our trope that's in our head of how these people sound. A British accent sounds old, uh -huh. old timey to American ears, right? Um, but now there's a movement to try to portray Cleopatra as African American, right? So we had this recent Netflix documentary, Cleopatra, and it was actually headed by scholars. So it had real good interviews 
with like, at the time, oh, I'm blanking on her name, but it was the president of the Society of Classical Studies. She's an African-American scholar, and she's fantastic, and she starts off by saying how her grandmother always told her that Cleopatra was black, right? And so they chose consciously to portray Cleopatra as black. And so, you know, this erupted into this kind of argument over identity and all this kind of jazz. And the reality is we have no fucking clue what Cleopatra's skin tone was. We certainly know on her father's side she's of Macedonian descent, but there's good reason to think that she has on her mother's side an African background of some sort or another. Whether that's, you know, what we would consider black African or not, that's, that's, that's more complicated. But uh, the point is, is we don't know. And so portraying her in either way is still going to be accurate. And so when we think about who we portray, Denzel Washington is going to portray a Roman senator in The New Gladiator, for example. There's nothing historically inaccurate about that. There were African senators, right, from Africa. And yet so many people are going to go crazy over the fact that Denzel Washington is playing a Roman senator. That's ahistorical. And it's like what I think is when we see stuff in Hollywood, when it's portrayed in Hollywood, we should just make things like us. Because in the end, we don't have an answer for who people were in the past, who that specific senator was or that specific individual or whatnot. We don't have that. And so I think there's to, to only portray white people in the Roman senator in the Roman Senate, A is A historical. B, it's problematic with our own views on how to support like actors and actresses in, in Hollywood, right? And so we should promote diversity in these kind of situations. I see zero issues with that because after all, this is modern fiction, mm -hmm. not a history after all. We can make it whatever we want in the end. Tying into something we brought up a long time ago, um, this horrible book, uh, The Iliad. Um, <laughs> I remember, uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's, it's funny you bring this up because I had a, my English teacher told me this, so this might be total bullshit. But there is a part, um, I think it's before the big battle of Troy, I think, I think it's before the big battle where there's a guy who's reading off. It's like two pages of just like fucking names of this guy. It's is a whole here. chapter actually. It's uh, book two. Okay. Was it a whole the chapter? catalog of ships. Okay. Oh, maybe, maybe it might've <laughs> been. That's what it's called. Yeah. yeah. And I remember that um, our teacher explained this. Oh, okay. So then maybe you know if this is true or bullshit. But our teacher explained to us that like, it's a lot of names, it's boring or whatever. But when people were doing this, uh, a lot of this was done via oral history. Uh, the bards or the people reading this or whatever would be trying to say names of people that would be listening because it made the viewer or whatever feel more involved. And like, that's my family's name or I remember this or whatever, or, or not remember it, but like, oh, like this ties to me or whatever. So a way of like modernizing even something that would be as ancient is like trying to make the audience feel more like they're involved in it or related to the particular media that, you know. Yeah, in fact, there's big debates about that specifically specifically because we think that the, so the Iliad is part of oral tradition, mm -hmm. right? And it's really cool, actually. We can, we can ground truth or fact check the Iliad to understand how certain parts, so some of the shields that are described and spears that are described in helmets, they reflect, you know, Bronze Age armor and weapons and stuff like that. But other shields and, 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 and weapons and whatnot, they reflect Iron Age stuff. So we can see that this poem was started in the Bronze Age and was only written down probably a thousand years later for mm -hmm. the first time. And what's really interesting is that catalog of ships, because yes, there's certain parts in there that seem to be a historical to an earlier period. Specifically, we think that the very first writing down of the Iliad happened under the tyrant of Athens named Pisistratus, and that's why Athens is mentioned in there. However, like, other, Athens is not a major figure at all in the Iliad or whatnot, but we think it was a nod towards the person who was, you know, having it written down at that time. And so we can see how this sort of work changes over time and reflects different sort of cultural values, material values, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think that that's really valuable to, to think through, that what you create today in Hollywood or a fictional book, it's designed for a modern audience. You're never going to, when I've taught Hollywood classics, like classics and film and stuff like that. That. And what people don't seem to understand is there's a difference between authenticity and accuracy. So we, what we crave is authenticity. And what that is, is it's something that feels real, uh -huh. right? And, and so often what is authentic is a modern conversation that relates on other films we've seen or other books we've read. They've, there's this modern culture of what antiquity looks like, and we have that bias of what it should look like based on all these movies we've seen. But 
that's different from accuracy, yeah. which of course is what actually things were like. And we don't actually want accuracy yep. because accuracy is, is it's not gonna look right to us in the end. We want authenticity, that feel that sort of grabs us and feels real. And in the end, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a work of art for a modern audience. And we should never lose sight of that. And that's why I'm fully for you know, diversity and, and whatnot in films. There's no reason that should be an issue in my mind. It's a modern fucking film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's a modern film. Cool. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah, I guess. Last question before we wrap. Tell me about a time on like a dig or something that was like one of the most exciting moments for you. Maybe an item you pulled out of the earth. Uh, what was like, what's like one of those standout memories for you? I hate this question. Because <laughs> one of the things that I think is that, the, that people need to understand that archaeology is about patterns not some discovery. And I've discovered some crazy wild stuff. I was field director when we excavated what's called the Tomb of the Griffin Warrior. When we excavated this thing, it was a shaft grave at the Bronze Age site at the Palace of Nestor at Pylos, and it was an unlooted shaft grave. So it was the wealthiest find in Greece in like 50, 60 years, right? When we were digging that out, there was more bronze and silver and stuff like that, and then there was dirt. You know, it was that crazy to excavate. But that just created a lot of stress. So I, I, that was not something that I was excited for. Like I said, I'm interested in everyday people, not these elite snobs from the past. Um, so well, I'll talk about two things that I did like finding. One was the wall that is not a wall. So my very first time when I was a trench supervisor was at Pompeii. And uh, University of Cincinnati Project, Stephen Ellis, hey. Um, so I was uh, co-directing a trench right up. In, so, all right, in Pompeii, there's these city blocks, right? Sort of what we think of as a city block. And there's a wall that goes around the city block. And then there's a bunch of houses and tavernas and buildings in that city block, right? And uh, for five years, they put in trenches along the main wall of the city block. And they couldn't get a date for when the main wall of the city block was built. So they're like, that's your goal is to figure out a date for this, get under it, find stuff you can date and whatnot. And so we're digging and we find this really cool latrine, right? It's this latrine that still had a faint whiff of urine, even, it was kind of <laughs> weird, but it was a really cool little latrine, right? And so we're digging that as well and we're getting down to near the bottom of the wall. And I don't know, so, so the way Pompeii was destroyed, we have this idea that it was destroyed by like a lava. Not true. Vesuvius erupts, Herculaneum is destroyed by lava, that's another town closer to Vesuvius. But what happened is uh, Vesuvius ejects all the material into the sky and it rains down stones on Pompeii and it's buried in these stones that are called lapilli. And so what's really weird is I'm digging and that latrine is full of lapilli. Makes sense. That's, that's what fills it up, right? But I'm tracing this lapilli layer and I get to the bottom of that wall I'm supposed to date and there's lapilli under the wall, like going right underneath it. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And so, you know, I'm still a grad student. I call over the directors and other people. I'm like, this makes no sense. How is there a little pilly under the wall? And they start thinking, you know, when Pompeii was excavated, you know, the August Mao and earlier excavations, they remove all this lapilli, and the Italians use that as bedding for like uh, uh, highways and structures. It was good foundational material because it, it drains really well. Right? So maybe what this is, is it's from an earlier eruption of Vesuvius, from like, you know, a th I don't know how many hundreds of years before that was, uh -huh. and the Pompeians specifically used it as foundation material. And then we're looking, we're debating, we're thinking about it for a few days, and then the, the architect gets involved, like the, the site architect for our project, who, who works on architecture, and he starts looking around. All of a sudden, he's like, holy shit, Flint. Come check this out. And he shows me. You can see in the architecture of sites sort of different phases of construction. Like, you know, these stones look one way. Then there's, and this is really common at Pompeii because 10 years before the eruption, there was this big earthquake. So you see repairs and stuff like that in there. And he's like, look, this whole wall is collapsed right here and repaired, right? Here's what happened. And then we realized we had to go back to old Italian notebooks from like the 19th century. Turns out that the early excavators, they're clearing all this lapilli, and there's the city, there's the, 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 the wall of the city block, and then right here is the wall of the city itself. And they're dumping all that lapilli into that little void in between the two, and the pressure caused that wall to collapse. And they rebuilt it. It was a modern wall that was rebuilt by modern people. And that's why we couldn't get a date for it, because it was actually a modern reconstruction, not an ancient wall. 
And so it's like all this work to figure that out, right? And so it's just like, actually, that's because these early excavators did that and they didn't leave a clue to us about the fact that it was a repair, right? So finding a modern wall was really cool. Um, the only thing I took from this entire conversation then is that every archaeological find could just be stuff planted from other archaeologists. So <laughs> 6,000 year old earth, uh, 6,000 year old world, yeah, that's what I see, I understand. And in fact, yeah. we're very careful about marking it now. So whenever we finish an excavation, a lot of times, if you don't have money for conservation, we rebury it because that's how things preserve best. And so we put in modern coins and Coke cans and stuff like that so that a future archeologist that might not have access to our records, that will still be there so that they know this was excavated by us. Awesome. So it's very, very common. But my favorite thing, sorry, last thing, and this is why patterns are really cool. So I study animal bones and I've found a lot of cool patterns, but the one that I really like because it's fun is, 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 is we, we, we always record when, when dogs gnaw bones. So we see little tooth marks on the bones. It's kind of like you eat a drumstick, you leave a tooth mark, right? Actually, no. <laughs> Well, no. I don't eat the bone, but okay, but go ahead. Well, do you know what it looks like? Is it looks like you're chewing on your pencil. Okay. So we actually have bone styluses. Like chicken that wings. Yeah, exactly. Chicken yeah. Wing, like... So that's what it looks like. And so we record this. And the reason why I told you how a lot of what we study is formation processes. How did the archaeological record form? Well, dogs destroy bones sometimes more than other times. So we want to understand that to understand the biases in our evidence, right? And everybody's like, that's really boring and whatnot. I've, I've, oh, my, 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 I had this driving goal. One day I want to prove to non archaeologists that studying dog gnawing can actually be interesting and reveal something cool. And so finally, a couple years ago, I found a pattern that was. So I'm studying this Greek site on the island of Crete, and it's really cool because we can understand, we, it's a big excavation, so we have houses, and then we have public feasting areas, right? And I'm looking at the differences in diet, you know, that kind of stuff, and, and what's the difference between a feast and a, and a household meal. And so what's really cool is the dog gnawing shows up in a statistically significant pattern where uh, in the feasting areas, there's such a glut of meat that dogs get more bones. So it's not just a feast for the humans. There's more dog gnawing, which shows that, you know, they're giving more treats to dogs during a feast, which I think is really kind of cool. You know, like, so it's, it, it, our pets Goes back to the benefit. trash thing, kind of, right? Exactly, yeah, things yeah. show up in surprising ways, yeah. And it's not so surprising, but it's kind of cool to be able to prove that, you know, mm. that like, it wasn't just the humans that benefit from these big religious sacrificial feasts. It was our pets, too. They got a few extra treats, so, you know, that we, they, they should benefit from our parties. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Where can people find you if they're looking for your stuff? Yeah, I'm on Twitter and YouTube at Flint Dibble. I'm actually on most social media at Flint Dibble, my full name, and uh, my YouTube is Archaeology with Flint Dibble, so check me out. And for people listening, Flint, F-L-I-N-T, Dibble? Dibble, D-I-B-B-L-E. Okay. Yeah, check me out. Cool. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm making it a goal to share as much real archaeology as possible, have on a lot of different experts on various fun things um, about archaeology, yeah, so that people get a sense of it and illustrate it with cool images and stuff like that. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Cool. cool. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank Rob. You. Yeah. Or, thanks for coming, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'll do the shout-outs at the end. Sure. Uh, if you guys enjoy Bridges, if you want to see more, number one, make sure you check out our Patreon. Um, there you can get early access to everything. You can send in questions to upcoming guests. Um, so make sure to support us there. You can also uh, support us by checking out our sponsors. We are supp still sponsored by Ground, Share and Skill Ground News and Skillshare. There we go. <laughs> uh, Ground News is, I check it every day. I still do. Um, honestly, if you want kind of news that gives you lots of article options that reports on the bias and the factuality, Ground News is just kind of your one-stop shop for that. Uh, any store you click, you'll get anywhere from six to 20 different news articles on the exact same stories. So you can kind of check multiple articles for different perspectives. Uh, Skillshare, it's basically a community um, of DIYers sharing carpentry, photography, kind of basic skills that you can then learn. Um, it's a one-time annual membership. Sign up with our descriptions down below. Cool. Later all. Thank you for being here. The news is divided. Ground News puts it back together with coverage from thousands of outlets around the world in one place. So you can spot sensational reporting, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. Beside every headline, you'll see who owns the source, how reliable it is, and if they have a political bias. Multiple perspectives side by side, giving you a well-rounded view of today's biggest stories. Visit ground.news to learn more.